have a full house and the entire town council is accounted for. Welcome again to another evening of budget workshops with the town council. And today we are inviting our public works department to talk about public works and other stuff. Sorry, I don't have that in front of me. Thank you, gentlemen, so much for coming. If you would introduce yourselves to the public. And just before that, oh, uh, Mayor. Yes, um, so we are starting with oh, public with public works, but I, I want to um, let the council know that we are really proceeding on a good track. So I think the level of engagement has been good. I don't want you to be afraid of the of the schedule um, and taking taking too long, uh, or even if we have to postpone this evening. So while we're starting with public works, their operating budget. We're then going to proceed with a postponed uh, session of the, of the community investment plan infrastructure. Uh, one of the interesting things about uh, this, I'll tie this together with the budget modification that we'll, we'll be coming back to. Um, one of the things that I've proposed to you in the realignment of the, of the, of the organizational structure is to uh, merge engineering into public works so that we have a public works and engineering department. And it kind of works out that as you see the infrastructure of CIPs that will be handled by Dan and uh, his staff, but then uh, Jonathan, uh, the town engineer, who's now in planning and development, is kind of a natural fit. Uh, so that's gonna be the bulk of the presentation third uh, segment of this evening is planning and development. Now, our new director, uh, Jennifer, Jennifer Rodriguez, she is um, on Zoom monitoring the meeting, but she also didn't prepare that budget. But Jennifer is out uh, on sick leave. Uh, she's protecting the rest of us. We all know COVID and um, so unfortunately, she's having a bout with that and, 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 and symptoms still. Um, but should we not get to uh, planning and development this evening and we just need a natural break, I think we'll be able to accommodate that schedule um, and then Jennifer may be able to attend. But otherwise, Jose and staff are prepared to do it. Jose prepared uh, the budget. So I just, when we get to that point, uh, I hope the mayor will uh, make a determination, maybe a, a poll and and see if we want to take on that, that third segment of this evening's program. And with that, I'll turn it over to, to Dan. Sounds good. Thank you, uh, Stanley. Um, Madam Mayor, Deputy Mayor, ladies and gentlemen of the council, um, Town Manager Hawthorne, and to our, our, Bristol, our Bloomfield neighbors. Uh, my name is Daniel Carter. I'm the Public Works Director. Um, to my right is Glenn Garrity, who is our facilities manager. To his right is Merrick Bart Ritson, our operations manager. And to my left is Yvette Varela, who is our um, administrative aide in public works. Um, I asked Yvette to attend tonight, and so you can, when anybody calls the office, they can attach a face to a voice. Um, event is the one who fields uh, probably most of our phone calls from the public and um, does a whole host of other functions for us. Um, I'd like to direct your attention to the um, organizational chart. Um, public Works is um, made up of four division administration, which includes myself as director and Yvette. Um, uh, it, the division of field operations, BART is in charge of field operations. Um, the field operations division has a working, has a uh, field operations manager, a working foreman, three crew leaders, four heavy equipment operators, and 10 maintainers. The operations division is probably the majority of our labor associated with the different tasks that we perform for the town. Um, Glenn is our facilities manager or field operations manager as they call it. Uh, he is um, in charge of the seven buildings that we maintain, the town hall, the two libraries, the police department, this human services building, 
um, Bloomfield Volunteer Ambulance, and the Public Works Facility. Uh, he is in charge of one lead building maintainer, uh, one additional building maintainer, and five building custodians. All maintenance and custodial services for those seven buildings are administered through the Facilities Division of Public Works. Um, our fleet division um, consists of a fleet manager, uh, one fleet crew leader, and four vehicle maintenance technicians. So our fleet department maintains all of the town vehicles, uh, including public works, police department, general town vehicles at town hall, all of the vehicles used here at leisure services, ambulances. Um, we do occasional work on fire trucks. And that is, um, we take care of all uh, preventive maintenance and other vehicle repairs associated with that. And then surrounding the organizational chart is just um, a summary of a lot of the different tasks that we perform. And that's from building maintenance to road maintenance to snow plowing to athletic field maintenance to lawn mowing for our schools. Um, there's probably not a department in town that we don't service in one way or another. From the registrar of voters, we, we set up all the election polling stations every election cycle. Um, again, we assist the Board of Education, all of the departments in town. If, if there's a need for labor associated with any task you can think of, moving desks, um, you know, replacing materials, um, it's Public Works who performs that function. Um, again, um, Public Works Administration, um, that consists of Yvette and myself as a division. We have field operations. There are 18 employees in our field operations. The division conducts, conducts general street maintenance, uh, including management and oversight of roadway paving and resurfacing, line striping, sweeping, guardrail and fencing repairs, tree removal and maintenance, uh, general stormwater maintenance. Um, the town of Bloomfield owns one utility, and that's stormwater. So we, that is a utility owned and maintained by the town. Sanitary sewer, natural gas, water mains are all owned by um, um, uh, private companies, MDC for water and sewer, and um, Southern uh, Connecticut Natural Gas for, for natural gas. So we don't do, we provide any services for that. Uh, we also administer solid waste. Um, again, I mentioned the seven buildings that we maintain, um, and I'd like to get in on one, page 139, and I have a small summary that I've prepared talking about the general budget. Um, I'm pleased to submit the Public Works Department operating budget for fiscal year 2023. The proposed budget assumes the same programs and directed increased levels of service provided in the previous year. The budget I am proposing for fiscal year 23 is $6,152,280. This represents a $313,605 increase over last year, which equates to 5.37%. In general, the changes to this year's proposed public works operating and maintenance budget fall into one of three main categories. One, contractual, two, utilities, and three, increased directives. All three of these areas are outside of the department's ability to control or are directed. Please note that costs for employee benefits, retirement, insurance, et cetera, uh, are the same, and they are provided by finance for us and are entered into our budget. Contractual increases, salaries, benefits, et cetera, totaled approximately $76,594 of our increase. Utility commodity increases, such as fuel, electricity, road salt, et cetera, totaled approximately $218,271 of our projected increase. Directive increases, primarily exterior maintenance of infrastructure, totaled approximately $28,289 of our increase. Collectively, these three categories total $323,154. We were able to hold the budget increase to $313,605 by reducing budgeted line items in other areas. The mission of the Public Works Department is to provide quality operations, maintenance, and facility services to the town of Bloomfield. 
The vision for the Public Works Department is to be an industry leader and model for what it means to be a professional, capable, and certified Public Works Department. Um, I am requesting, and I will go over them in budget modifications, new positions for the department and the town, um, and we will discuss those at a later point. One of the points that I wanted to point out is that this department was reaccredited this year by the American Public Works Association. Um, we were originally accredited back in 2017. We are and continue to be the only public works department in the state of Connecticut which is accredited by the American Public Works Association. It's something that we're extremely proud of and I think it uh, signifies the level of professionalism that we have reached as a department and uh, I am proud to um, to, to, to be able to relay that to you and, and to the residents of town. Um, on page 141, I'm just going to go through the separate line items that are identified um, and, and, and just give you a brief explanation of what the increases or decreases are associated with. So on page 141, full-time payroll, um, $23,919 increase or 0.94%. Um, that is a contractual increase. We were able to hold that number to 0.94, being that we had a couple of retirements and we uh, promoted some employees who started at a, um, a, a lower step in positions. So we were able to realize some savings there. Um, over time, um, uh, a reduction of $3,801 or 2%. Essentially, that reduction was due to we reduced um, our projected overtime due to that we don't have the demands that we had initially when the COVID uh, epidemic struck. So we had high demands for custodial service for wipe downs and things like that. Um, you know, we've been able to get away from that as the pan pandemic has progressed. So we've cut, cut that item by $3,800 or 2%. Um, page 142, operating expenses. You'll see a big bump there in equipment rental, 93.75% or $7,500. That increase is associated with um, the rental of a crusher to recycle asphalt. And that is an expense that we, in, um, we take on about every three years. So what happens is we do road work throughout the course of the year. We stockpile old curb and asphalt in our, on, our, on our property and about every three years we rent a crusher to come in that crushes it, makes it into usable material for us so we can recycle it and use it in our other operations. So it's not an expense that we incur every year. That's why you're seeing the big increase on that. Um, other contractual services, 9.2% increase or $8,400. Um, a contractual increase um, is covers things like pavement markings, sidewalk repairs, um, weather work services, um, environmental professionals for our environmental permitting for the operation of our seven facilities. Um, the increase of $8,400 is primarily due to a fleet maintenance software cost associated with fleet maintenance software. We didn't have um, a computerized fleet maintenance software program. We did acquire that last fiscal year, and there was an annual cost every year to maintain that. That's a tool that we, that we pursued and, and we, we are now have in place, and that's what that 9.2% increase is associated with. The education training, down 31.77% or $7,880, primarily due to we had costs in our education and training budget this year for our reaccreditation costs. So that is every three fiscal years. So obviously we, we just got reaccredited in January. So that's a cost that we won't incur next year. It would be three years out. Um, bulky waste disposal, 14.29% increase or $2,500. Um, primarily due to the um, disposal of woody debris. Um, and we've gone over budget over the last couple of years We've had the tropical storms now two last year and this year. We didn't, um, you know, we didn't, we, we didn't get declared disaster zone. So we absorbed the cost of collection and, and, and um, disposal of all that woody debris around town. So uh, primarily that's what that, that line item is for. 
Uh, lease payments, lease payments, 5.17% increase. The only lease payment we have is for an energy performance upgrade project that was conducted back in 2014, where we did um, lighting fixture upgrades to the seven buildings. There was a, do you remember, recall how many years? Is it a 20-year uh, payment plan? I think it's plan? a 15-year variable uh, okay. lease agreement. Okay. So. Numbers do change, but that consisted of uh, major renovations and upgrades at our town hall facility, uh, 55 fan coil units that service the entire building, uh, along with across the library, uh, site lighting across town. All the buildings were upgraded at the time to new induction fixtures. So again, that's a 15-year variable schedule. Yeah. So that was something we assumed when we did the the, the upgrade. So. Initially, obviously, we, we saw a decrease in our utility costs, but over eight years, they've crept up. Um, but that's um, what that, co that cost is associated with. Uh, the bottom of page 142, utilities, 22.28% utilities. That's um, uh, natural gas, electricity, water usage. Utilities have been escalating at an alarming rate. Um, street lights. You know, we pay well over $300,000 a year electrical costs to power our streetlights. And every year we do utility projections based on past year's uses. This year we're, we're looking for um, an $83,000 or $96,000 increase associated with utility cost increases. Um, telephone, minor change, 2.52%. We have a third crew leader. We need one extra um, uh, mobile phone. That's, that's what that cost is for. Um, building maintenance, uh, increase of $9,326, 3.24%. Um, that's for building maintenance, obviously, is a lot of our service contracts, elevator service repairs, electrical repairs, fire system maintenance. Um, um, so the increase is a result of um, uh, additions, of duct, duct vent cleaning in town buildings that was eliminated in last year's adopted budget. Um, exterior maintenance, 34.64%, big bump. Um, along with some of the new infrastructures that we're, that we're building in town, there are additional costs to maintain those infrastructures. So we just put online an arboretum at Philly Pond. You know, it's, it's, it's a manicured garden space. It, it requires money and, and, and effort to maintain. Um, the other big increase is the maintenance associated with um, the new soccer fields here at the Human Services B Building. We have a turf management plan that was provided by the installer. Um, we followed it last year um, to keep those, those soccer fields in good serviceable condition. Um, uh, it was over $20,000 a year, so that was part of that increase. Maintenance supplies, a 5.63% increase uh, or $1,000. Um, and that's just small uh, maintenance supplies that we use in, in, you know, in, in, over the course of our three divisions. Uh, cleaning supplies was no change. Going to page 144, um, uniforms and clothing. We have contractual requirements to provide rental uniforms to our employees and safety shoes. These, the $2,300 increase is associated with the contract to provide those um, those uniforms and, and shoes to our employees. Um, construction materials, no change. Um, construction materials are um, pothole patch, um, concrete for sidewalk repairs, um, things such of that nature. We're, we propose no change in that line item. Um, equipment and parts, $23,000 increase. So primarily, this 10.3% increase is associated with parts that we uh, provide for our fleet service. So we have three parts accounts for fleet in town. We have our general fleet, PD, and we have our senior service buses has their own separate account. Last year, I needed to float $10,000 to fleet to keep them going through the month of June. There's been a tremendous increase in the cost of just general automotive parts. And that, that um, money there is to cover, um, uh, to keep, keep pace with, with those um, increases. Um, gas and diesel, 40.42% increase. So that is to cover strictly the increases associated with 
gasoline and diesel used by our fleet. Um, we sign contracts for 12 months at a time, futures for, for gasoline and diesel. Um, the cost of gasoline, we, had a, we have a contract that goes from January 1 to December 31. We just signed a contract um, with an increase of 58 cents a gallon for gasoline. Uh, diesel expires on June 30th. We're carrying a projected number of $2.50 a gallon. That gallon price was developed in December, and the world has changed tremendously since December. So I question if, if we can get it for 250. My hope is we can. Um, the contracts uh, are out. We've got um, a low vendor, but the price is, is a little high right now. And we're kind of, um, we're rolling. We're, we're gonna we're gonna see what the market does. We've got we've got some time before we have to lock in on a price. I, we've got until June 30th, so um, right now we'll have to see where that goes. But that's $72,743 increase, or 40.42 percent. Technical supplies we left flat with no change. Um, other supplies, $2,000 um, deduction of 5 percent. Um, those, those supplies are agricultural supplies, traffic, general supplies. We, we, have, we had a big reduction, um, especially at the initial start of COVID in athletic field paint. We weren't, you know, the, the youth groups weren't playing, so, you know, we had, so we had some savings there. So we, we did lower that to be more in line with what we're seeing as trends for our expenditures. Um, food and meals, a slight decrease of 0.27%, it's $24. Food and meals is a, um, it's the, the majority of that line item is a contractual obligation. When we have employees working outside of regular hours, if they're on the clock at 6 p.m. or midnight or 6 a.m. outside of regular hours, the contract allows them a food allowance of $12. So that's the, the, the big majority of that food and meals items. Um, road aid materials. 10.68% uh, increase or $23,295. Um, that is associated with um, salt prices for de-icing in the winter. Also, um, catch basin cleanings. We clean 33,055 catch basins every year. It's a contracted service. Um, the cost for that has gone up a couple dollars this year. Um, so that's associated with that increase there. Um, Technical and office equipment, 5.22% increase. Um, that is associated. The primary cost was that is the um, vehicle charging stations. So we have two. We have four vehicle charging stations in town. They were installed in 2014. They're kind of an antiquated. Um, there are more efficient charging stations. So in other words, the amount of energy that you get to charge your vehicle out of a brand new station now is in, in the same period of time, ours are not that efficient. So they're, right now, they're eight years old, we've been having repairs with them, and we're actually looking in to get a grant to upgrade the charging stations to make them state of the art and hopefully you know, be more efficient. Uh, let's see here. Payroll taxes, that's a derivative. It's 7.65% of our payroll, which is contractually controlled. $651 increase, that um, follows along payroll increases. Op-Ed op -ed is employee benefits. Um, it's a reduction of 40.04% or $32,012. It has to do with we have only one remaining employee, no, two remaining employees on the town's pension system. So those were contributions that were made by the town to support pe future pensions. So as those employees cycle through and retire, um, we, we have a less of a expense associated with that. So right now I believe we only have two employees. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, life and disability insurance, a 23.28% increase. $4,886, um, that's just a cost of, of, of the insurance. It's something that we just passed through. 
Uh, medical insurance, 9.19%, $59,436 increase. It's not something that we can control, unfortunately. Um, retirement, again, um, minus 1.59% or $4,625. Again, we, we have a slight increase because we had employees in the pension system, two of them who retired this last year. So I know that was all very quick and a lot of numbers, but that kind of defines our operating bid budgets and the line items, our ups and our downs. Um, if there are any questions on that, I'm not sure if you want us to roll into the budget modifications and then we'll take questions at the end. Yes, That's fine. You. So budget modifications. So budget modifications are items that are not part of our base budget. Um, and I have five. My number one rank is reclassification of Yvette from a clerk typist to, uh, to an administrative analyst. Um, it is in keeping with the duties and the functions that she provides our department today. Um, a clerk typist too is, is, is a very, if you read her job description, it's a very antiquated title and her responsibilities are not even close to what we have to or what we need her to do for us. She is our accreditation manager. She is our uh, accounts payable clerk, accounts receivable. She pays all our bills. She does all our payroll. She does all of the administrative functions that keeps a department of 35 people moving from uniform changes to, you know, reaching out, questioning invoices, um, verifying invoices. You know, we get, is that how many invoices do we pay every month? 2,000? Every one of those invoices has to be in, has to be rectified, right? So if we're buying asphalt and she gets an invoice for $10,000 worth of asphalt, she's got to find $10,000 worth of packing slips. And when you got 35 people running around, buying things, picking things up, dropping stuff off, it's, it's, a, it's a daunting task to do invoicing. So Yvette, honestly, is the glue that keeps us going. Um, I believe that a, tr a, a true um, depiction of her duties is more in line with an administrative analyst. We have positions in town that are compensated at a much higher level um, that I believe don't have the responsibility that Yvette has. So um, that would be my number one priority and it would move her from um, a pay grade of eight to a pay grade of 13 with a $21,000, $843 increase. Dan, let me <clears throat> elaborate on this one some. Um, this is, this is kind of complicated, but when I started orientations, after I started Public Works was the first department that invited me to come over. So I've been here just over six months now. Um, and this is something that Dan made me aware of even then. The reason why I say it's, it's far more complicated, a request such as this isn't this simple. Fight. I'm probably not going to ask you to fund this as a budget modification request for a couple of reasons. Even if a department um, were to make the case to you and ask you to approve it, job classifications are a part of an entire system and it needs to go through what I'll call a scientific process, which is well known throughout the throughout the universe and positions need to be assessed uh, and determine where they fall. So while this is uh, the department's best guess, I can't tell you that it's accurate. In fact, I'll tell you um, that based on Dan's appeal to me and several other departments and their what I'll call top administrative position. We've got people in categories, and I bet it happens uh, to be one of them, that's called the clerk typist. In this case, clerk typist two. We spoke at the last session um, that it has been many years since the organization did a comprehensive classification study, going back to 2008. I believe. 
so going on 20 years old. For this particular union, which Yvette is a member of, um, a study was done, but it wasn't implemented. Probably some negotiating issues that were going on. You'll recall that 2008 was, we were going through the recession, and my understanding is that the administration, I don't know if the council was aware or voted on this, uh, but asked for uh, wage concessions, which I think some of the union groups agreed to. UPSU, as I understand it, um, wasn't willing to take that concession. So I think it has evolved over many years because no classification study was implemented for this union going back to, I can't even tell you how far back, but probably well over 20 years over. A further sign that our classification system is just way outdated. Now, I did commission through uh, kind of a side agreement with this particular union to at least look at just a few classifications. I think there were two, which affected three incumbents uh, in this clerk typist category. One happens to be uh, a position in the town manager's office that Abby fills. And that's a whole nother issue. Unionized positions in an office such as the town manager's office. I'll discuss that at another time because I do have an issue with that. Um, and then in other departments, again, those top assistants. We commissioned a study, brought in an outside party that the union had agreed with, a neutral party. There had been a stalemate between, I'll call, human resources director and the union president all of these years as well. Literally no reclassifications have happened because of this stalemate. So no overall classification study and positions and as people have been required to do more or less, but I've heard a lot of more um, and not even reclassifications. So it's a mess, it truly is a mess. And so I don't blame Dan and other departments. They might not have submitted a request such as this, but it's something that we need to, we need to fix. I will be recommending as a part of the organizational realignment. And I can't tell you what the union's position is going to be or the incumbents. But there is a position of administrative assistant, which I, if I had to classify what Yvette is doing based on my study, what I think Abby is doing, what I think other department top people are doing, it's probably what should be in place. I've never been in an organization where departments didn't have administrative assistance that they were that they were using. It would be a promotional opportunity, but would also be a position outside of the outside of the union. I've told department directors, at least those who were involved in this study, that they need to talk with their employees uh, and it's a conversation that I'm going to have with you and I'll talk about it more when I present my organizational realignment as one of the one of the budget modifications but this is a very personal issue to me particularly in the town manager's office um, and I don't want to make this personal but everything is public but even this week as we begin negotiations I've got a member of the town manager's office who is one of the uh, union staff that I'm going to have to negotiate with. Never been in the town manager's office. One of the first things that I say at, at a staff meeting to my team, and I think it offended the HR director at the time, past HR director, I said, the union is not our enemy, and they absolutely are not. They are one of my constituents. The employees that are represented by the union, and I don't mean this in an offensive way, but they're one of the town manager's constituents. And I don't see that to any, to any union. Have we had some staff who probably have 
not been given their due? I believe so, and I want to address it. But are there some things that are not right for the organization, in my opinion, particularly when we've got a position that simply hasn't been utilized? Happens to be a management level position. For positions such as in the town manager's office or that department directors have to, have to rely upon. Some level of confidence, but it's, more than, but it's more than that. So we've got a lot to fix in the future. You'll hear more when we get to the human resources department uh, as well as when I present my budget modifications. Um, so it is Dan's top request, and, but for other reasons, it's probably not one that's going to make the priority list because it's not that, not that simple. Also, wouldn't it be fair to other areas of the organization and where those haven't been submitted. But I'm going to address it to you from a centralized standpoint. Sorry, thank Dan. you. No, thank you. All right, so <clears throat> if we look at page 148, the second ranking position for a budget modification is for a second shift custodian. So currently we have seven buildings, 185,000 square feet, five building custodians. Um, that's, that's a stretch for what they have to do on a daily basis. Um, but the problem is with that size staff, everyone's entitled to a vacation, people are out sick, things happen. So too often we fall into a position where uh, we're one short, two short. I mean, there's been days where I've had one person to cover the town. So this creates an abundance of overtime, extra duties, but it also takes away from uh, detailing. Uh, which is, you know, what we do is we do quarterly building assessments. So I'll go through every three months, I'll go through every building, look it over from ceiling to floor, and we have a grading system. They have to meet a certain requirement to pass our standards for that building, which is set forth by the APWA. And right now I'm, I'm struggling with that uh, to keep the buildings presentable and in tip-top shape for the public. Uh, I think it's important too to take into account that we're going to gain an additional 10,000 square feet with the new library constructions between Prosser and Wittenberry, which will further, you know, uh, create a bigger problem for myself. Um, so this position is important to me to provide the standard of service that I would expect for Bloomfield residents and staff. And uh, currently I'm thinking of utilizing this position on second shift. My reason for that is buildings like this. So currently our um, custodians work from 7 to 3.30. But in a building like this where there's weekend use, people are around the clock, probably till 10 o'clock some nights, people are still actively using this building with no custodian here. So I would probably have them work at night here and then it would also act as a floating position to cover um, any absences. So we're still keeping the building up to standard. So the initial um identification of the need for a second shift custodian was when this building opened in June of 2019. There was a tremendous amount of demand for um, use of the meeting rooms in this building and we were struggling to, you know, different civic organizations, it's, it's a brand new building, it's a nice building, so they were using the building at night, they had their host of programs at night, so there was a lot of setup of rooms for meetings and functions and we were struggling to keep up pandemic hit us in 2020 obviously that that demand died off we're, we're we're reopening we anticipate when we fully reopen again that demand is going to come back and in another year we're also going to have two brand new libraries and, and elizabeth could probably speak more to the library sciences but you know, the, the newer libraries have meeting spaces and public spaces. So we do anticipate that, that the libraries will have increased demands for public meetings and civic organizations and uses of their facility by different groups, which will also put an increased demand on. So that is the, uh, the reasoning for that as, our, uh, as the budget modification and that is our second priority. Um, our third priority. So I've only been here in Bloomfield for six years. And in our, my six years here, the demand for services associated with uh, grounds maintenance has increased. When I got here, we had the Town Green, we had some beds at Town Hall, we had Mary Hill Park, and we had the front of the PD. It was, 
and, and, to, and, and, and that has always been a subcontracted service. And, and the demands for service were nominal. But now we've created an Arboretum at Philly Park. We have this new building that is, has, a, has a courtyard and it has landscaping. All justified, all beautiful, but it needs maintenance. And we anticipate a greater demand when the um, libraries get rebuilt. And so um, it, it's just the size of the detailed planning portfolio, portfolio and the demand for increased service levels has increased. Um, and again, the increase is due in part to new planting areas such as Philly Park Arboretum, the Town Green has been redone, Human Services Building and proposed library renovations and other recent projects as well as increased planting awareness at previously existing areas in public parks and facilities. In conversations with the manager, he's identified that, you know, in his, in his opinion, that our parks need more attention. And he's right, they do. They do need our open spaces. We're blessed with tremendous amounts of open space, but we need to make them more accommodating for our residents and visitors. So um, uh, that is the, the, the reason for that. Um, the position supports the, the 2014 Park Master Plan Study prepared by Fitzgerald and, Hall and Halliday. Um, and we would anticipate that it would be a seasonal 20 hour a week, non-benefited position. Budget modification priority four. Um, the department created an assistant director of public works position in 2017 as part of the department's succession plan. Uh, by de definition, the assistant director of public works could, could either be the field operations manager, public works, or the field operations manager, facilities. After the resignation of the public works director in February of 2020, an initiative was launched to eliminate a public works management position. A compromise to that initiative was to eliminate the assistant public works director responsibilities and pay from the field operations manager's description. Uh, subsequently, the field operations manager public works and the field operations manager facilities position have been filled without the assistant director duties in their job descriptions. This eliminated the department's formal defined succession plan. The consequences of not reinstating the assistant director of public works is the department will not have an official succession plan in place. Oh, Dan, let me I'll expound on this one too. So this will be a recurring theme that you see in budget requests from departments. Assistant directors, and I, I really do want to connect it to succession planning. Um, in some departments, we have such a position. In other departments, we don't. I've not been able to determine any rhyme or reason for those departments who do and those who, who don't. Um, I think this one can be a fairly easy fix, not necessarily just uh, needing, to, needing to throw money. And I'll be discussing this more in the organizational realignment. Organizational realignment is the example that I gave you of engineering moving to public works. There will be issues such as do we employ administrative assistance for more consistency and departments being able to manage their budgets, uh, succession planning, assistant directors. I think by the council approving a generic title of assistant director will give some flexibility in a case such as this, and I'm not saying that I necessarily agree with this, where an existing position, perhaps with existing incumbents, could be reclassified. In other cases, um, that's really not an option. Uh, you heard from social services, one of their, social and youth services, one of their ask was for an extra position, so a much bigger price tag. Uh, we're not going to be able to fix this overnight, probably not in a year. I don't know if we can do it in, in two years, but I think we can create a generic title uh, so that as conditions uh, manifest themselves at the right opportunities come along that we can have a good succession plan throughout the organization. Succession planning isn't just about an assistant executive of the respective departments. It's far more. It's in a comprehensive article to the CBLT uh, just today. We need an official succession plan, but I do worry 
one of the things that keeps me up, uh, some of our high level positions, whether directors or managers, um, where I'll tell you, we are much too dependent on uh, certain, I just have to call it as it is, incumbents. Uh, it's not their fault necessarily. Well, it's not their fault. Uh, it's, the organizational, it's an organizational responsibility. Um, but I worry if something happened to certain individuals and we not only have a succession plan, but we don't even necessarily have, you know, how do we get this job done tomorrow if uh, such and such person isn't, isn't, isn't here. We haven't done enough cross training. Um, we've got a lot of, and I see it in some departments even, um, where we've got too many silos. Certainly have silos between departments. We're overcoming some of that. It's the reason why we have a community building leadership team. We're communicating, we're getting to know each other, but there's a lot of work to, a lot of work to be done. So you'll see this assistant director, which is a real need for departments, but there's just inconsistency right now, and we need to work towards a, uh, a solution over time. Um, our last budget modification um, is for maintainers. And I have asked, we have routinely asked for positions in my time here. And um, when Mr. Hawthorne came here, we met, we had good conversations about what we struggle to do, what we do well, what we don't do well. And his direction to me was, you need to tell me what you need to do your job. And this is what I believe the department needs to do our job. Um, and the, the, um, the, the five positions, the maintainer twos, they're the labor force of the town. So the department has experienced a growing level of responsibility and increased service level demands. And the staffing levels have not increased to keep pace with these demands. Um, the town's deteriorating storm drainage infrastructure, which needs repairs prior to resurfacing, has increasingly impacted, has increasingly impacted the capital roadway program. Grounds maintenance responsibilities on athletic fields, parks, and common areas have increased in size, scope, requested service levels, and required occurrence. The 2014 Park Master Plan prepared by Fitzgerald and Halliday recommended in 2014 five new positions. Since the 2014 Park Master Plan study was prepared, three new facilities have come online, the Human Services Building that we're in now, Philly Park, and the Greenway Trail. In addition, the department is aware of initiatives to improve several of our existing facilities and passive recreation areas. These facilities include the town pool, 460 Tunxis Avenue Park, Prosser and Wittenberry Libraries, and Billy Fields. It is anticipated that improvement of these facilities will bring increased demands for essential department services. Initial consequences of not funding these positions will be no increase in maintenance service levels. As facilities are improved and upgraded, core function maintenance responsibilities will fail and service levels will deteriorate from their current levels. That concludes our presentation of our operating budget and our budget modifications. And if any of the council or anyone has any questions, we're, we're available and here to answer them. Thank you so much for that comprehensive overview um, and detailed discussion, excuse me, or presentation of the department and the budget modifications. You know, I want to thank you guys for everything that you do. You, we probably talk three times a, a week, like I'm sure other counselors do, as far as the boots on the ground and needing, you know, um, direct services with our constituents. So we do appreciate all the work that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. And we know that Bloomfield is with a, experiencing a period of growth, right? And with growth comes more resources and requests. And the town council has a very challenging job ahead of us to make sure that we can maintain those that growth um, from a sustainable level. And I just want, had a few points here and then I'll open it up to my colleagues. Can you remind uh, the, t the town council and the public in regards to the base budget and how it relates to maintenance with the Board of Education? And is that reflected in this budget? And if so, where and what page? 
Okay, so uh, this, we do provide services to the Board of Education. So the services that we provide are not specifically identified. We don't have a line item for Board of Education support. Um, but what I can tell you, so what services do we provide? So we provide general maintenance of all Board of Education grounds. That's lawn mowing, weed whacking. Um, we do small maintenance type projects for Board of Education. Um, we maintain their athletic fields. So that is grooming, line striping. We maintain the um, artificial turf field at the high school. That needs to be groomed every 100 hours of service. And then we also provide a labor force after events for cleanup and uh, those things. We provide the Board of Education with snow plowing of the, um, their parking lots in the winter. And we also supply um, de-icing materials, road salt, to the Board of Education so that they can treat their sidewalks and parking lots. And Bart, is there anything? that I miss there that we're doing for, and we also provide the same services to the Board of Education as we do to all departments. Maybe a request for a few bodies to move some furniture or, you know, those types of things. Mm -hmm. Supportive vehicles. During the snowstorm initially, we'll do the clearing of the parking lots, the initial stall application. After that, it's maintained by the Board of Education. We do have a budget. They are included in our budget, so we know how much salt they're using as we are very advanced in our salt management. Yeah, so we, we are starting to try and track the, the services and the, and the times that we pay, but there is no separate line item for Board of Education support or services. So one of the ways that we could address that is a budget modification that uh, is in my, uh, in the town manager's budget. It's called the cost allocation study, and I've written you about it. Um, that would be a tool, if we proceed with that, that could take those kind of costs that we know uh, are dedicated to a different agency um, and, uh, and, and pull those out. The other way of doing that would be budgeting differently in the future, but it doesn't necessarily help us. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm really giving a plug for the cost allocation study for when I get to it. Uh, but that's something that we can specifically identify and, and, and pull out once we go through that process. Thank you. Um, it's very impressive that we are the only um, accredited um, public Amer American Public Works Association, so that's great. I just want to say kudos to that. I was, from a contractual standpoint on page 142, it looks like I thought I, you mentioned that um, this is where our sidewalks come into play. I am disappointed that there's not more in there for sidewalks. I think that there's a larger demand. I don't know if that's in relation to the maintainer requests because we contract that out. And then are you saying that if we bring the maintainers, if we up the maintainer positions, that some of that work, they are going to be qualified to do some of that work in-house? Or is that unrelated? So first of all, um, with respect to sidewalks, so when I came here six years ago, we, we had very minimal funds available for sidewalk maintenance. And I do uh, give credit to the council. So for the last at least three years, correct me if I'm wrong, Carrie, the council has supported our capital program for funds to do sidewalk repairs. So some of, we have over 20 miles of sidewalk in town. Some of them are in, were in such poor condition we couldn't conduct minor maintenance and make them usable. We we to the point where we were removing sidewalks and replacing them. And that was what we're, we're using subcontractors to do. So we have a capital request for sidewalk repair and maintenance. Um, and it has been funded last year. Um, we've spent half of the money. We anticipate spending the second half of the money before July 1st, so we are um, we do have a program for sidewalk repair and replacement, but that that one small light item was you know we do bituminous patching of sidewalks, and we also we have a um, a vendor that we bring in and we we do um, trip remediation. It, essentially, when we get a anything over a quarter inch, we grind the sidewalk. It's a very efficient 
way to eliminate trip hazards. So that's what that is associated with. Okay, thank you. And then one last comment in regards to uh, the reclassification. I think that uh, that will support a broader goal in regards to bringing equity overall in the organization from a salary, a gender, and a race standpoint. So I do applaud our town manager for that, and I'm excited to see your presentation. And in regards to the succession plan, I think as the town council, we are we are worried about that too. So I do thank um, the town manager and the public works for speaking on that today. Councilors, Councilor Merritt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I have a couple of different things. You're, you're talking about the. Um, um, <clears throat> At one time, the Board of Ed took care of maintenance of all our town buildings, and uh, all, the, all the custodians worked for the Board of Ed. And um, I'm wondering why now, I think it makes sense for, there's not much difference between you know, a custodian in the um, school and custodians other places. They, I don't know why we don't add that to the list of things that we can take over um, and work together on. But just make that on the side. Uh, makes sense if you're all set up to maintain buildings. That makes that probably should do that uniformly around town. Um, I, I I have to say I I'm probably the first person here that uh, I used to work for. Uh, uh, merits department and mowing grass in the, around the schools in the in the 50s uh, as my summer job. Um, I you mentioned the the need for moving, setting up tables, and re rearranging rooms. And like here, we went from a 95,000 square foot building where we could leave a room set up because we had so many of them that it was not a problem, to a building just a little over half the size. So we have to keep moving chairs around. And, uh, but I, it reminds me of the library I used to, every time, they only had one space, I think, for meetings, and they kept changing it, but it was, they did it themselves. They didn't call your department in to do it. It was an all hands on deck thing, and I'm not sure if that isn't a good thing, but uh, um, I don't think we should, you should have to show up every time they rearrange a room. But, uh, I mean, I think it's a matter of staff. I'm not so sure that the that the departments that that occupy this building have the they staff. They may not available. have it. You're right. Yeah. You know. So, but I, I just make that point that, that, yeah. that maybe with their they'll have more space. They won't need as much moving around of chairs. Um, that's one of the costs of going to smaller space. Is that if you increase the labor cost, I think the position study is an awfully good idea. I, I, I'm familiar with the history of that going back into the 80s, and uh, well, we had some. We we haven't done a good job on that over the years. And I think you're, you're you're quite right. That needs to be done, and uh, have more equity in the pay of, of various positions. Um, but that's all I have. I, th I think you guys do a great job, and uh, I, I I hope with the engineer being part of you, maybe we'll get some sidewalks built. Uh, We've had some on the capital budget, like Park Avenue, for 10 years, and nothing's been done. So maybe, maybe, maybe that'll start happening. And, and, and some of the bike paths have been planned too. Maybe that that'll be another part of it. So I'm optimistic that that will be part of it. Thank you, Council Mayor. Can I just comment on a part of part of your comment? Um, And this just happens to be a, a story of something that was shared with me, but also reminds me of, um, you know, my familiarity and, and experience. We are in a in a union environment, mm -hmm. which isn't a negative thing. I think it's a positive mm -hmm. positive thing. But even something as simple as um, your comment of, of moving the furniture I around, yeah. uh, and a department director shared with me just this week. Uh, I, th I think the rearranging of this furniture, and this is the third time, <laughs> uh, but, and I came over for the first time on Monday when the staff put it together, and I, I think that was our department directors largely, Scott and Dave Malesko and, and uh, Yvette in India, 
So I, so I think they moved the furniture around. But the department director had before that shared with me an experience, and I don't think it was even moving furniture. I think it was something a lot more simple, where we did hear from a union representative that that's our job, so be careful. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Deputy Mayor. Thank you so much, uh, Dan. And uh, I am a big proponent of uh, the work that you all do, so, so thank you. I have a couple comments and one question. Uh, the, the first is more of a comment. Uh, with respect to the budget, we have been told, or the suggestors with these budget modifications, we have about $900,000 for 11 departments. And when I look at the total of the requests for the modifications, it's over $500,000, about 58% of what we plan to do. So obviously I, I hope you realize that it's going to be a very difficult job for the council to, to make whole on all the requests that you're asking for. Uh, because uh, when I go through the modifications, all of the departments thus far have had some very compelling rationale for their modifications, but I realistically don't know, or I do know, we can't do them all. I understand. And I think you realize that. Um, one of the questions I have, and I'm just not nitpicking, but when I look at the utility cost, are you saying that there's an increase in consumption, or are you saying there's an increase in uh, the cost of utilities because can we are we doing anything to control yeah. so, usage um, Glenn can probably speak to utility he does the projections primarily it's a cost in uh, delivery and of the utility um, our usages can you speak to that Glenn the usages are going up with increased activity especially in this building for instance where you know I'm scheduling each vac to run seven days a week Usually these units run 12 to 14 hours every day. So there's definitely an uptick in building usage. Um, as you know, all the utilities in general are going up, delivery costs, service fees, uh, you name it. It's just the trend. But um, we are looking at initiatives to kind of complement our utility usage, such as uh, we mentioned in our capital improvement meeting on solar panel studies for buildings. and. Uh, we are doing our best to try and cut back on that cost. Um, you know, I, I cut back our building schedules through the automation controls. I try and cycle back our usage as much as I can. I know it's a big number we're throwing out there, but uh, we'd rather be a little uh, conservative rather than run out of money, you know, uh, with several months to go and then have to explain to departments, uh, I'm not sure what happens here, you know. But, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of calculating, and it was a surprising number to me as well, but we felt it was a, it was a safe number, you know, and I know it's, it does raise a few eyebrows, yeah. you know. All right, and the next question is with respect to the second request for an additional custodian second shift. Yes. You, you made a comment about it would save costs from overtime, and I was thinking that the, the footprint for the system should get smaller over the next 18 months with the library consolidating, right? We're gonna have a swing space, so I'm taking that those two buildings will no longer be part of the conglomerate of what you all have to do. And it's likely that they won't go online for another two years. Uh, so is that factored into sort of the need, I guess, uh, for that uh, second and it is. supervisor? It is. It is. We, we initially requested an additional position and it was primarily to address this building in 2020 um, you know we just see the library as an additional responsibility on top of that um, initially we talked with the leisure services director about potentially creating a porter position um, but after discussions you know we felt that if we were going to bring on a, a full-time position that we would like it to be a custodian so that we could you know, gain the benefits of efficiency by moving them to different buildings that we needed. But um, we, 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 this is not our initial request for a position, like uh, a second shift in Stoke. And the last one, and I don't know if this is related to what you all do, but you were talking about bulk waste, and there's been a lot of concern about solid waste and saying that the costs are gonna go up precipitously. Is that anything to do with public works, the solid waste removals? Uh, Cost in town? No. So my comment uh, on solid waste was we administrate the the service of solid waste. 
So there is a separate account, correct, Carrie, yes. that we pay our solid waste, our, our, our uh, collection and our disposal fees that are separate from public works. Okay. Thank you. And I believe it's carried in, is it in the manager's budget or is it just a separate budget? It's in fixed costs. Fixed costs. Yeah. Uh, Councillor McCleary. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, Dan and staff, uh, thank you um, for all of the work <coughs> that you do. Um, it, uh, Public Works, um, I go back to my state and local government class where uh, my professor shared with me that Public Works, when you're in town government and local government, that Public Works is the lifeline of a, a city or a town. And so um, the emails that we get with storm updates and trees falling down and the work, all of the work that you do, um, I want to thank you. Um, and it's no surprise that you're one of the only um, public works department in the state that are that is accredited. And so uh, kudos to you and your team. Um, a few years ago, I had an opportunity to do a ride along during a snowstorm and visit the facilities. And um, it was eye opening um, at the time. Um, and um, I asked then the public works director at the time um, related to a cadet or a apprentice program for um, Bloomfield residents. Um, I noticed that you have a number of, <coughs> of maintainers um, in here, and as the deputy mayor said, uh, it's over half a million dollars in requests. Could you benefit from a training program of cadet of local um, youth who, and we talk about workforce development, it could be a, it could be a great transition from high school into to public works. Does your department have uh, any plans to um, establish a cadet program similar to the police department, the fire departments, on introducing our kids here in Bloomfield to the public works field? Yeah. So we do not have a, a formal cadet program or have plans for one now. Um, we have, uh, we do a number of public outreach type events to try and introduce ourselves. We, um, um, the Minority Construction Council, we, we attend their, their job fairs every year. Um, we have uh, touch a truck events for our younger kids in our schools. And that's all part of our programs and mission to you know, get the, the word of public works out to, to, to younger people. Um, you know, the public works of, of 40 years ago, those days are gone. This, we, we promote this as a profession. We take our jobs very seriously and, and we try and get out into the community um, to promote them. But at this point, we don't have any, uh, any defined um, cadet program in place. Part of it is um, we've struggled with some of the youth employment, even part-time. You have to be 18 years of age to operate uh, power equipment. Um, you know, we have CDL requirements. Um, so those are things that um, sometimes preclude us from from participating in some of like the summer youth programs because the, 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 the students that are participating have not reached the age of 18. Okay, um, my next question, thank you for that answer. Um, <clears throat> my next question um, is relative to um, the current gas prices. Yes. Um, I noticed that we have um, the cost, it increased um, to like 2,040, is it, am I reading that right, 2,046 cents? So let's see. So we budget for 67,000 gallons of gasoline every year. Mm -hmm. We were paying $1.88 a gallon. That expired on December 31st of 21. Our, we renewed at $2.69 a gallon, which is an incredibly good price to everybody because we all know we're paying $4.50. But you also, we do not pay state taxes and, and some federal taxes on, a, on our fuel. Uh, municipalities are exempt from it. So we do get a, a, a fuel at a very attractive rate compared to what you and I pay at the pump, but it is increasing. Um, and again, I stated we, um, we, we budget for 29,000 gallons of diesel. Cur our, our current price is $1.86 a gallon. That's gonna expire on June 30th. We're budgeting for $2.50 a gallon. That comprises that $72,743 projected increase in just fuel costs. Thank you. Um, but my last question, uh, Madam Mayor, um, is related to uh, your um, education and training. Um, is what 
educate educating the public. I know you came to the um, admin and administration committee meeting a couple of months ago, maybe two months ago, and we talked about um, the education around sidewalks and um, whose responsibility it is to maintain them and to plow them, et cetera. Um, do you have anything in your budget to address education of the general public re relative to uh, issues related to sidewalks, uh, trash disposal, et cetera? So we do, we do have some minor um, expenditures included in our budget. That's kind of, um, you know, costs associated with preparing our brochures, but we don't have or have we planned for any new big outreach programs? No anti-litter campaigns in our parks. You know, I know so, um, one of the counselors mentioned uh, going to one of the local parks and, parks and seeing a lot of trash. Um, do we have nothing around anti-litter, no programming? No, we do have a program. So we're actually, um, uh, the leisure services director and I are working with someone from the outside and um, we were working on an anti-litter campaign with some installation of some new signs and some outreach. It's something that we're working on, but it's, it, there's no cost associated in the budget associated with, with initiating a new program. It's just something that we kind of routinely do. A great question. And last, I know I said last question, but this is very important, just came to me. Um, you talked about um, the maintenance of uh, landscaping and et cetera, um, and it was, due to you was outsourcing it a couple of years ago. Yeah. Uh, what is your process for a, if for the general public listening? If there's a small business um, Bloomfield based landscaping company that is interested in doing and receiving contracts or public works, how do they go about it? Do they have to go to Nancy? Do they contact your department? How do they get certified in order to become uh, a, a contractor to do some of this work? Because um, I know a number of landscaping companies, I don't want to call them out, that does very good work. They live in Bloomfield, um, they're young, and it would just be great to see them working alongside Public Works to maintain um, their community. Right, so all of our procurement is done through the purchasing and, and risk department. So if we develop a contract or a bid, it all gets advertised through uh, purchasing and risk. Thank um, you. And again, and just kind of referring back to, to Mr. Hawthorne's comments, you know, there's always there's a union component to a lot of uh, our maintenance work that we do. So it's a delicate balance sometimes. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Councilor DeBethan Brown. Thank you. Um, yes, the union will have a piece of bid. That will get me with it. Um, so I think we need to, to be very careful with that balance. Um, I do want to say thank you to the Public Works Department. I do know firsthand that if you call them, they will come. Um, during the storm that we had, there were people that um, this work down here on um, uh, Philly Street was locked up, right? Tyler was locked up, and we called other work. I'm sure you all had other things to do, but we to make sure that our residents were safe. And for that, I say thank 
Councillor Curtin. Yes, thank you. Um, Dan and team, uh, I also want to echo some of the same sentiments from my colleagues. Uh, the one area that I believe um, this town is second to none is when it comes to what we do during the, the winter storms. Uh, you can go outside at any point in time and be able to you know, drive around and you guys do a phenomenal job. So uh, kudos for that and continue doing a good job. But I, I just want to step back. I want to start off with a comment. I think it's an overall comment uh, to the town manager. When I look at the budget modification and the things that you're talking about and restructuring, those are all good initiatives. I believe that's the right direction. But to my colleagues on the council, these are things that we have to phase out. It will happen over time. I don't, just don't want us to go from zero to 90 miles and think we're going to be able to solve all the issues that we have been dealing with for a long time. So I would say while I support and agree with some of the uh, budget modifications, I think it's unrealistic. This budget process, especially with our transition out of COVID and a lot of unknown ahead of us in regards to what are we doing to generate new streams of revenue, right? Because that's what's gonna really sustain a lot of things that we're suggesting right now in this budget. Um, and, and the one area that I struggle with and keeps me up at night uh, is how are we gonna be able to maintain when something goes into the budget, it's there. We look at a lot of the, the salary requests and wages, those are all gonna keep growing, what, 3%? It's gonna go up every year. And I think why it's critical for us to come up with a plan on how we're gonna really get out there and market the town of Bloomfield to attract investors to come to the town. And this is why I struggled in the last five years because I think we have to strike a balance in regards to how we maintain our open space and a balance with trying to drive economic development. Because that, to me, will help us to be able to provide the level of services that we need to provide to our community, make sure we have the right staff in place, and all of that flexibility. But the one area as I go through the budget, and I think doesn't really present well to me, is how do I equate the costs to the actual the repair and maintenance of our public roads, right? Because that's one area that folks talk about. They can. When they get out of their homes in the morning, it's right in their face. And we know for a fact across this town, folks complain about their roads. You know, I know public works have tried their best to make sure they maintain the roads. You've come into council from since 2017, I've been on the council, to talk about how do you address certain roads. It's a science. It's just not, you're just there saying, we're not gonna do this area, we're not gonna do that area. You have a matrix in place to be able to handle that. And part of it is funding, right? No capital budget. And that's why I think it's important, especially now we're having 6.2 million that we're talking about. I think we have to really focus in on how much of that are we gonna put towards repairing our roads? because that's gonna have a direct impact in the quality of life of our residents, and they're gonna feel in a sense that, hey, I'm getting my tax money, because that's what folks say. We have one of the highest taxes in our surrounding area, and people don't really see what they're getting for that. And the one area that they can really zoom in on is their roads. So I think that's something that we really need to do a better job at in presenting to the public, because. When the public is looking at this, they go like, wow, we're talking about 65% uh, that goes to salary and load. And to most folks, they're looking at that going like, oh, wow, why are we paying that? What are we getting in return? They can't really touch that, right? They can't touch and feel that it equates to that. So I think we have to do a better job in aligning that, uh, Mr. Town Manager, to be able to explain to the public. Mm -hmm. Because right now, to me, it's very tough in, in approving any, in, in my, in supporting any of the, um, the budget modification, not that I don't understand the need uh, or the wants, it's just that I cannot equate that with future tax increase within the town when folks can't really say, what are we getting for that? 
And this is not just directly to public works, I think this is across the board. And I think that's the struggle that the council is going to have to deal with as we go through this process to make the final decision. So I appreciate everything you guys are doing, and I'm here to support, but we have a tough job ahead, and you know, just, just know that we're going to do everything possible to, to get you what you need. I appreciate it. Thank that. you. And, and, like and I acknowledge, I, I just want to acknowledge the, the manager because um, since I've been here, I haven't had the opportunity to sit with all of you and, and, and even make our case for, for budget modifications. We, you know, the, some, some of our requests are not new. It's not all new this year. It's been a repetitive thing, and I, I honestly don't know, you know how much you've been told in the past, but I just want to acknowledge the manager because I do honestly appreciate the, the time that we can sit with you and have frank conversations about you know what we see and what we think we need so thank you all and that and that's the philosophy of whether you fund it or not uh, you should at least know uh, even if it's the perspective of the, uh, of the staff which is you know who really get paid the, the big bucks a, a kid at the council get paid uh, the big bucks but for anybody who doesn't know uh, they do it for free it's voluntary <laughs> and uh, uh, but but I think Council Curtin made some made some very good points. Nothing that you said that I that I disagree with. Um, I think the road example, and, and I'm excited. I think with our being able to expand uh, CIP this year, um, roads we know is something that the community thinks of. I don't know what you're ultimately going to approve, but if we double the budget, I hope the Public Works is prepared to. Uh, uh, to do it to ha have the capacity we'll have to ask that question but I'm going to give a plug for another for my budget modifications <laughs> community community assessment or community satisfaction survey yes we do hear from those uh, about the roads I'm complaining myself some of the roads that I that I drive on some of them are the state roads actually um, but we need to hear from our community uh, because it's some of those silent issues that the community cares more than we may realize. And I'll give this example. I agree with uh, Councilor Curtin that our tax rate, I, I worry about it for our neighbors. It's high compared to what I'm, what I'm accustomed to. But yet, you took a new library and you took Philly Park and I'll tell you what the community cares about every place that I've ever been. They care about parks. They care about libraries. Uh, those are always at the those are always at the top of the of the list. But this community has even supported, you know, new public works facilities or a human services facility. Um, now that's saying something about this this community. I know they feel the tax burden, um, but I'm not willing to second guess them until I know. So the community satisfaction survey, we're just going to get into all of the nooks and crannies so that they tell us what they don't like, the kind of treatment that they may be getting, going to different offices, but also what do we want this community to be? So that's just another plug, Mayor. <laughs> Sorry. Can't wait for your presentation. Um, <coughs> Councillor Harrington, good to hear your voice. Uh, thank you once again for your, your presentation. I'm, I'm just making one note, and that is that you as the director made your first priority one of your staff. Among all these other requests, and that goes to show one, that you want to take care of it, and that the type of position that she is currently being paid for is well under what she should and deserves. So um, with regard to that, I am encouraged that our town manager will be making some uh, changes, but I, I think just the fact that you have identified this as your number one priority tells me that this is something that you want. And uh, aside from all the others, and I know you need the others as well, but you look out for your staff, for the people that serve you and serve the town. So I thank you very much for presenting. Thank you. Oh, 
Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Madam. Oh, Mayor. I didn't see. You. Sorry, pardon me, Ms. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just wanted to piggyback off what the uh, town manager talked about with the community survey. And again, I want to reiterate that I think it will be very important that it's broad based because I don't want to see the same familiar folks come in here. I want to make sure that we reach everyone in the community, those voiceless, those folks who are often left out of the process. They need to be at the table, and we need to be creative and find a way to get to those folks because I'm afraid that you'll get the same group of people who come out all the time and will take that as being the majority, but it really isn't. And so we, we have to be very thoughtful and intentional about how we reach folks yes. in the community to make sure that everyone has a stake and a voice in this process. Absolutely, this Thank will you. scientifically base. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll tell you more Thank later. You. Council Politis? Yes, <clears throat> just a little, just a couple questions to gain perspective um, on operations. And I'll preface um, my comments to the full clarity that they do have a sudden model How many? Um, part three. Three, right? So we have three main mowing crews, the outskirt areas, the primary high profile areas, and then the schools and outskirt areas. Along with that, we have a large format mower uh, that takes care of the, to help to facilitate and help out with teams on that one. And then once during the month of August, as you see on the reservoirs, which is a DP contract, um, you'll see our large format mower out there as well. So. But the majority of the times we have, and those are teams of sometimes only one guy taking right. care of areas, it's, it's limited. How many, how many of them did you say are mowing? Three, three to five probably employees. Yeah, we yeah. try to have a minimum of five employees. And how many days a week are they mowing? Every day. Five, yeah. five days a week. So just, just to gain some perspective, I mean like half your, I mean, half the people that are working for DPW that are trying to take care of this town are simply mowing all summer long, you know? So, I mean, when you ask for five maintainers and you're looking for more work on roads and you're looking for all this stuff, these guys are out just mowing lawns every day. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when you look at what they're asking for for maintainers and you want more stuff done with roads, and I know it's money, but that's what it takes to make the world go around, unfortunately. Council Thank you. Councilor Mon. I'm actually, I'm glad that you brought that up, Councilor Politis, because I was going to touch, a, touch on that point. Um, the first thing that people see, of course, when they're driving through our town or when they're, uh, when they're approaching our town is our roads, our lawns, so on and so forth. Um, it's very unlikely that someone that's driving down from Sinsbury, driving from Hartford or Windsor, so on and so forth, driving through our town is, you know, going into our buildings. Our buildings are very important. Maintaining them is very important. but. Um, you guys have a very, play a very vital role in making sure that both our town is well kept both inside and out, um, uh, if I can put it that way. So one, I want to thank you for the job that you're doing. I do want to keep that in mind uh, for the council to echo Councilor Politis's point that, um, you know, that's the first thing, that, that's the first perspective that people get of our town driving through is uh, the condition of our roads and our um, in our grounds. Uh, so they play a very vital role in looking at the request. It is quite a bit of money, but it may just be money well spent. Just a quick question as well for the, for the town manager um, or, or even public works. Um, even if we don't, let's say, uh, allocate the money for all five positions, can we allocate money for some of the positions but not all of them, or do we have to do Council ultimately, and even in my recommendations to you, um, I, I may do partial funding recommendations of some of some of these. Thank you. That? Awesome. And then just one more comment, because um, Councillor Mahan brought up a great point in regards to the maintenance piece of it and the uh, perception of coming into Bloomfield. 
in um, facilities administration, what I really would like to see is a more nimble process in regards to connecting with um, uh, CT dot. Uh, because we know that we they are responsible for a chunk of our roads, our inroads, or our yeah. our gateway roads, right. and so I really would like to see some of that um, in the future as far as the operations are concerned and connections and contacts and mm -hmm. and I know it's pretty hard to get in touch with the commissioner when it's it's like hey yeah. what, what about Blue Hills what about Wittenberry um, Park Ave and so um, as it relates to the maintenance and the perception I think that we could really do a better. Um, I would like to see some more. Um, yeah, we have a good relationship with the maintenance garage. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Condot's resources, I think they, they, they are struggling as much as we are maybe more. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I know <clears throat> it's been a sore point for the last two years. We, we've had to reach out to, 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 to you guys to help us with Cottage Grove, with the, with the median, where it, was, it just wasn't being mowed. And it was, it was getting to the point where it was, it was becoming a sight line issue and it was becoming dangerous. Mm -hmm. and, but we do have a good working relationship with the maintenance, the, the boots on the ground. Um, but there are some policy changes there from Condot that is, you know, they are trying to shift a lot of responsibilities to the towns. Okay. And that's kind of a legislative priority, mm -hmm. maybe something that we, we can reach out for you. We can have some conversations in the future on it. Wonderful. Look forward to it. All right. Councilman McClary. Thank you. One more. I got a question here, a text message from somebody watching. Um, and the question was, um, what is the process for residents to um, connect outside of just calling and putting work orders in, like for lighting issues, for mm -hmm. um, hazardous, you know, sidewalks, et cetera? Do we have a portal where they can track the status of um, work orders? And, and so we and don't have a portable that's available to the public. We have a work order system. So quite honestly, every inquiry, any request for service gets entered into that work order system. Um, even, if, even if the response is it's not something that we do or we can do, we keep record of it. So we do have, um, we could print out a list of pothole requests that we, and, and with, that's what we routinely do. We, we generate work orders and you know we do potholes at this time of year, we're doing them two to three days a week, we'll generate a list and of all the locations and where do we get that information from we get it from you we get it from our neighbors and our residents and we get it from our own staff um, so there is a, a work order and a tracking system work orders are, are entered they're open they're closed and um, I think I report uh, on a, a, a twice a month basis to the manager and, and when you see I think in in, in his updates to you you'll see um, I'm not sure what hit the verbiage you use. I, I use the words Q alert. That's the program that we use. I'll say we open 243 and we close 271. Those are requests for service that we address every month. So um, I would just say stay tuned to Stanley's updates to you. You'll see that in there. That's the explanation for what that is. Great. Maybe this is for the town manager to. I know there are uh, towns like Manchester and and Hartford who has the who have the online portal where. A resident can go in, file it, and then watch Absolutely. their ticket go through. Absolutely. Um, hopefully, Public Works can look in, in the tap through mm -hmm. Mr. Manager, yes. look through that software. Yep. Hopefully, maybe not this budget, but maybe next budget uh, season, we can see that software and to just make it a little bit more uh, customer front facing friendly. Yes, those are those are commonplace these days. Now, give credit to Public Works. If they're contacted, uh, they're going to follow up. There are automated systems. Uh, one of my proposals in organizational realignment deals with uh, IT. Um, and I'm intentionally adding the name information technology and innovation. Um, we're helping them to get better staff, new resources. Um, so we're, go we're going to be moving on some of those things to bring Bloomfield up to date. Thank you. Thank you so much. Councillor Mahan. I'm sorry, just really quickly. Don't be sorry. My apologies. Um, I know you wanted, we were going to move on to the next thing, but I do want to <laughs> say um, the department's doing a phenomenal job at uh, patching up the roads. I take the School Street Blue Hills Avenue Cottage Grove route to go to work. And uh, of course, during the winter, naturally, uh, we do have a few potholes, but um, the department has been very quick at taking care of those potholes. <laughs> Uh, so I really appreciate, once again, the work that you're doing and how, how quickly you attend to the needs uh, of the public. Thank you. Any last comments before we relieve our uh, Public Works Department? 
Thank you so much for your time, uh, your presentation, and um, you know just the work that you do. Thank you. Appreciate you. Have a great night. Thank you. We will now invite our community investment plan. We're going to move into infrastructure. Uh, this was for those on the phone, I believe. We had to shift this over to tonight, so we're going to try to get it covered. I know this is one of the popular ones. Yes, and Dan is going to be staying. Jonathan is going to be joining him, our town engineer. And I believe we can be pretty efficient going going through these. All right. Who, who is it? Jonathan. Please. Oh, Jonathan and um, Jose. Yeah, no, Jonathan and Dan. Oh, gotcha. Oh, Dan's sticking with us. Yes. <laughs> Half the project is. When? No, I guess they're going to do an instruction now and then they're going to do it. Yeah, that's right. Doesn't matter. Um, so that would be here, right? Welcome. All right, so we are moving into the infrastructure portion of our agenda. And thank you for coming and thank you for being here with us tonight. And if you could please introduce yourselves and let us know what page you will be on. So, yeah, so um, Madam Mayor, members of the council, town manager, staff, um, you, you know, Dan Carter and uh, Barbara and I are staying up here. From for their portion of it from Public Works and and I'm the town engineer I'm Jonathan Tisi and also with me is my deputy town engineer Sarah Cody and we also have a number of uh, projects for the infrastructure so but I think if at your leave I think we'll just let the Public Works continue with their presentation and I think it'll be more efficient that way and then get to our projects when they're through theirs and they'll mean jumping around a little bit, but, but I think overall it will be more efficient for us as it gets late here. So, okay. <coughs> so I am working off of, um, starting on page 48. Of the CIP document. Of the CIP um, Community Investment Plan book. So 48. So uh, first, project for public works is hazardous tree removal um, this initially uh, this line item is used for us to uh, hire subcontractors to remove hazardous trees that public works is not qualified to work on so we do not work on trees that are entangled in power lines we're not certified to do that work so there are uh, um, a number of trees that we have removed every year and we solicit quotes from vendors to do that. And this line item funds it. Um, we're asking for, last year we were funded to, for $15,000. We're asking for $25,000 this year. Um, primary reason is we have been suffering since 2012 an infestation of the Emerald Ash Borer. So uh, when this infestation started in town, the, 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 the town manager at the time asked us, well, how, much, how, many, how many ash trees do we have? And, and we have no idea, and we still don't have any idea. But the, the infestation is serious. It's going to kill every ash tree in the state. Um, and we have 85% of our trees, hazardous trees, that we are removing under this line item are ash trees. So um, we continue to see die off of ash trees um, so that this this fund this additional or this twenty five thousand dollars would fund the um, contractor services to remove hazardous trees. Um, the second item in our in our uh, capital investment plan 
is roadway improvements. So um, we uh, are asking for $1.55 million for roadway improvements, and that is what Councilman Curtin spoke to, our road resurfacing program. Um, and the road resurfacing program um, is entirely funded through state funds. Um, and just a, a note about road resurfacing. So there's, there's the physical work that we need to do. And, and, and Councilman, you're exactly right. We can't pave roads fast enough. But there's also, we, we have to be careful what we ask for. If, if the council were to turn around and give me $9 million or $10 million, I can't administer $10 million worth of work. I have a lot of pre precursor work, storm drainage works that needs to be done. But this, that's just a little sidebar. But this, this roadway improvement, that 1.552 million um, is, is the monies that we use for our capital road work. That's our milling and paving, our um, reclamation, full depth reconstructions, our overlaying. We, we, as you know, we use a number of different methods to resurface roads and we are on an upward trend. That's a great thing. We're, we're, our roads, on the average, are improving based on our asset management tracking and the program that we've been following. So that's a good thing. Um, Madam Mayor, the third item on page 50 is the sidewalk repair replacement. That was the item that I referred to that um, when I got here six years ago, there was no money being allocated for sidewalk repairs and replacements. So these funds, and the council has supported this for the last two years. Uh, we're looking for $50,000 next year. This is money that we use to primarily do, uh, use vendors to remove and replace sidewalks that have just reached the point of where they can't be maintained or they can't be patched. Stormwater drainage repair, various. So that's a $50,000 line item. We ask for it every other year. Um, it allows for drainage repairs to areas in town um, and projects where we've previously done work are on Wade Avenue, Applewood Drive, West Newberry Road. So we have been fairly successful in using these funds to hire contractors to do drainage repairs where the projects are relatively simple. They don't involve a lot of engineering and um, uh, analysis work or construction, they're not complicated plans. So, you know, w w like for instance, on West Newberry two years ago, we had a culvert that was clogged and, it, there was, and, the, and the water was backing up behind the road. It was December, the water started washing over the road. We had a major icing issue. We tried to jet the pipe twice. We couldn't clear the pipe. We just made the decision, we're gonna go in, we're gonna rip the pipe out. It was in poor condition to begin with. We used this fund to do that and for $40,000, we removed that pipe, replaced it, and solved our problem. It was a simple culvert. It wasn't that complicated. Jonathan deals with the more involved culverts where you might be doing some drainage analysis or reviewing upsizing a pipe for capacity. We just deal, these are relatively simple jobs, and we've done a number of them in town, and I think we, we use the money very efficiently. Um, urban forestry assessment on page 52. So um, we consider the, the, the trees in this community as an asset. And um, the inventory is required to support other master plans, including connectivity, rails to trails, complete streets. Um, it falls in line with requirements for our American Public Works Association accreditation, um, the master plan, the, con the plan of conservation and development. So this particular project, we're looking for $36,500. It's a phase plan. Fiscal year 2023, we would um, develop a tree inventory and inspection resulting in an assessment of trees within the parcel boundaries of the seven municipal buildings. So we would have an inventory of our seven buildings. That would be phase one. Phase two, similar approach, um, except this would include the um, the, the properties, the Board of Education properties. So we had a, a, a complete inventory of the trees and their condition. And then phase three um, would be uh, an, assess or, or, uh, um, an assessment of the trees on our parks, parks properties and our open areas. Um, and, and the point is, is that a forest 
is something is an asset to a community and, it, and it's something that should be managed and obviously leveraged. So there may be opportunities for, um, um, you know, tree cutting, you know, controlled tree cutting. You know, like you say, a, a forage can be, can be managed. So there, there's a potential revenue source there. If you have a good stand of trees and you, you, you can selectively cut, not all of them, not clear cutting, not even anything close, but you can go in and se selectively cut and up for a potential resource. So that's what that, pro what that project is. Um, and then the, the page 53 is an urban forestry assessment is the right-of-way tree inventory. So we know alongside our public roads, we have a right-of-way associated with it. So the town is responsible to maintain trees that are within the public right-of-way of our public roads. So very often we get calls from residents who have a tree where you might say it's in their front yard, but it might be three or four or five feet off the road. Technically, the town is responsible for that tree. So if the tree is hazardous or needs to come down, it's the town's responsibility to take it down. And this kind of played into the emerald ash borer infestation when the manager asked me how many ash trees do we have. And I, I, I couldn't give him an answer because we don't, have a, we don't have an inventory of our trees. So, you know, we've been managing the tree removals that are necessary for the emerald ash borer but um, this is just a further getting into managing the asset of um, our public trees. Page 54, guide rail replacement. Um, we've, we've actually knocked off a lot of guard rail replacement. We didn't have a defined inventory and management of the existing roadside guard rails. We had a lot of old, outdated, um, poor condition, old cable and post guide rails. Those are not code any longer. Um, and we've replaced um, a number of those uh, sections of guardrail over the last five years that I've been here. And we're looking for money in fiscal year 24, $25,000 allocation. Um, Stanley, do you want me to go through all our projects or do you want me to focus on what's on the spreadsheet here? Okay, so I have addressed all of the projects that we have under fiscal year 23. Just so you know, if you, if you continue in your booklet, you'll see other projects that we have identified that are in outlying years. Um, and and it, they cover a host of different areas, but the fiscal year 23 requests I've covered. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I, I handed out a sheet. I'm gonna take, uh, for efficiency purposes, I'm gonna take uh, uh, our projects a little bit out of order, kind of grouped them together, because there's, there's a lot of things about certain projects that are, we don't need to be redundant on for each project. I'm gonna start with the flood mitigation projects. Again, this was in your, in your you remember in your workshop that you had shortly after the election and uh, you know, there was a little exercise you had for what was most important, and the flood mitigation uh, issues came in as number one. And, and so, essentially, we've identified, um, you know, after last year, after the, the, the tropi first tropical storm and a very intense rainstorm, we had uh, at least seven areas in town where flooding actually impacted uh, homes and that, uh, really that were associated with under for the most part undersized uh, facilities that, of the town um, and so that's where we've got these seven projects that are listed under flood mitigation this is a pro you know is these are to, again to issue with storm drain system for floodwaters entering houses or other significant property damage or repeated significant street flooding um, these will you know, these projects will reduce the need for first responders to have to respond to flooding issues in these events, reduce the maintenance, bur maintenance burden on the town, you know, due to high and due to higher quality, better, better performing infrastructure. Uh, the seven projects in order, we'll start on page 27, which is Hill Farm Road. Um, and what the issue here is, is really uh, kind of a combination, I believe, of, of some pipes that might be slightly undersized and 
uh, some design of some catch basins that uh, has water um, bypassing catch basins and getting down to a low point in the road and at that low point in the road uh, the relief point is 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 you know in through a, next to a house through a backyard and the water and it gets into the house that has happened uh, in talking with the property owner you know a few times it, this wasn't the first time so that it, but but it's a relatively to, to address it is relatively inexpensive from a you know from a drainage you know this type of project standpoint for we've got $160,000 identified for that project. The next one is a little more extensive and one that you know hap has happened quite you know very much repeatedly, which is a Newport Drive area. Um, it's a it's a lower area. They, we do get extensive street flooding in more areas than we're looking to address here, but there are like two areas at least where we've we've had. Um, uh, flooding that that uh, impacts houses. The picture that's that you'll notice in your book. That's the actual intersection of of Newport Drive, and oh boy, I'm now, um, I'm drawing a blank. Nolan. Nolan. Nolan yes, thank you. And Nolan, um, you know, it looks like this kind of you know when we get very like high flood events, um, and and again the relief point when it it has nowhere else to go when there gets to be so much of it is actually through a side yard that affects the house to get out to um, Mountain, Mountain Avenue. So this, again, because of the, the nature of it, even to, to address this intersection and, and one other location, we're looking at a, a larger project, 350,000. But again, I think this is very important. This one is one that has definitely been on, on the list for a while, um, you know, trying to get this done. Uh, third project, Alexander Road Drainage Outlet, um, an issue where... Uh, what page is that? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I got to go. That's page 32. I'm sorry. Yeah, I remember to do the pages. So let's jump forward to page 32. Uh, a project again where uh, um, we've got an outlet from a, a relatively, I mean, I'd say a modest, modest or medium-sized drainage area, but this is a low point in the area, uh, an older section of town where the storm drainage has been in place for a long time. So the whole system is just undersized. It all ends up down there. There's one catch basin. It can't keep up with all the water that it, it's trying to between the pipe and the basin, and the release the relief point is down a driveway, and uh, and at times when it gets to be enough, that will enter the uh, house has a will enter the house at the uh, um, what used to be the garage. I'm not sure if it's finished inside anymore. It was at one point, but but still we we end up flooding a house. Um, it's really this is an issue of, of replacing the pipe and. Uh, upsizing the catch basin just to try to provide that relief and perhaps to do some regrading on this on within the property just to keep the water away from the house. Uh, the next one is on page 33. This is Maple Avenue Mallard Drive, uh, which is involves. So this is a very large drainage area uh, leading to this. In both cases, we got 60-inch pipes that go under both roads. Um, leads directly to. Uh, Tumble Down Brook in the golf course, um, and there's one house on Mallard Drive that does that that does uh, experience flooding quite regularly. That that flooding is mostly due to backwater um, that that comes all the way down from the Maple Avenue area. So to to potentially even address this is is requires the replacement of both those pipes, and also the Mallard or the Maple Avenue one is one where. Since I've been here, I believe there's been at least three times, maybe more, where uh, the, the flooding there gets so deep that it, it ends up stalling cars and we have to have, you know, fire department, whatever, respond. Me, and, me last time. What? Me, myself last yeah. time. <laughs> so, so that's, that's a big issue there, too. Um, so, so that, you know, is, is, is a, but that's a larger project because there's both of those large pipes, so that's 660,000. Uh, the fifth project is Partridge Lane Culvert. The town has a culvert, um, uh, which runs. Oh yes, I'm sorry. Yes, page 36. Uh, underneath a uh, Partridge Lane that that carries a, a, a relatively small drainage area, but the problem is there's no there's no real outlet there. The culvert is undersized, um, and the house is built next to the culvert, and the the elevation of the house is lower than the elevation of the road which is the relief point so before the if when it does you know back up enough uh the water to get over the road will flood the house and there's a picture in you know in the, in the uh of what that looks like um and it's obviously very um uh, 
distressing for, for, the, for that property owner when this happens. Um, so th this, this would uh, provide a, a relief culvert, uh, which would, you know, again, I don't know if there's a realistic way we could, we, you know, we, that from there the, the, would be a lot much larger project to uh, completely make it so there'd never, it would never, it would always handle the water, but this is going to, that this relief culvert would double, more than double the size of the amount of water we can handle there. So the, the, um, would mitigate it very much and very much reduce the possibility that there would, you know, that flooding would reach that house again. On page 37 is High Hill Road Drainage. Um, again, we, it's a, a project that's quite complicated from a, from a flooding standpoint. The house that's getting flooded is sort of off to the side from the main, main drainage way that it has the issue. But uh, again, backwater causes flooding in the house. And this is a, it's uh, the pipe that's undersized actually, both inlet, the whole, most of the pipe actually runs uh, back through the woods, if you will. It's not directly on the road or part of our system, but um, I've, I've looked at it and there's no practical way from a, just a grading standpoint to create a release point. It, the, the solution is another pipe. And again, so that's where we get a, a more expensive project again of 365,000. And then finally is a replacement uh, or an additional pipe at the Wadhams Road culvert. Um, another project that again we've got one house that with a walk-in basement that before the water would crest the road to to provide a relief a relief for the flooding behind the culvert it will get up to the house and so this is this is a it's it's relatively straightforward inexpensive from an overall standpoint ninety thousand dollars but that would again reduce the the flooding um, that would pretty much eliminate the flooding I think believe at that house. So that's all our flooding projects. I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah to go through our storm drainage improvements. Sure, so quick question. Um, should I notice that a number of the projects are not on the sheet? Yeah. Should we go, still just go stick through with them or just stick with the, the with ones that the are on one for this year? Is that what yes. you like? Yes, okay. yes, this is the blue Sounds ones, good. the ones in blue. Yeah. Great, so thanks for uh, letting me be here. I'm excited to present. The next category of projects is improvements to the storm drainage system. So these projects consist of culverts, catch basins, pipes, channels, and other infrastructure that make up the town's drainage system. In this case, this grouping of projects mitigate road flooding where occupied buildings were not impacted, as well as address structural issues or insufficient capacity. So starting off on page 31, I think you'll have to go back a few pages. Um, this first request is an ongoing project to identify, evaluate, and address repairs and replacements of bridges, culverts, and pipes throughout the town. In many cases, performing this rehabilitation work now could avoid more costly and disruptive work later if a replacement's needed on an emergency basis. As you can see on that page 31, some of the metal pipe in our drainage system is unfortunately severely deteriorated and reaching the end of its useful life. So moving on to the next project on page 34, we have the Mountain Avenue Bridge Replacement. So this bridge was originally constructed in 1930 and has been identified as a need of replacement. Um, it's located over a small brook near the intersection with Doncaster Road if you wanna see it in real life. So moving on, um, the, I believe it's the last one on here, is the Florence Road sidewalk and under drain. So for this one, um, it's on page 35. If you take a look at the photo, you can see that this area experiences severe icing issues on the sidewalk and roadway as a result of high groundwater and drainage issues. So the requested project involves replacing the sidewalk, installing an under drain along that west side of Florence Road. So from an infrastructure standpoint, the new sidewalk would be protected from deterioration, also the roadway pavement by installing this under drain. Um, it would also provide a means for residents to tie into this drainage system. Unfortunately, that's not currently possible due to the location of street drainage and the other challenges with being mm -hmm. on that hillside. And I think so that... Now, yeah, now you're moving on to the... Roadway yes. Reconstruction. So moving. Um, 
point need to be very strategic. I mean, these are high price tag items. Um, and if I could recommend funding all of these types of projects, I would. Uh, but remember, we've also got an infrastructure bill, over a trillion dollars that's just been passed by the federal government. Um, I think within the last week, uh, Congress has authorized the actual funding for it. Um, so this is another plug for one of my budget modifications. We've got to be appropriately staffed for competing, both on the grant side and ultimately the project management side. Um, so I don't want you to just be overwhelmed, um, but we've got to be strategic in where we fund this year, capacity to do it, and then get the capacity to be competitive get the federal government funds that also come from us uh, to help finally address some of these issues. I'm sorry, Sarah. Great. So the last project, um, we're moving down to the roadway reconstruction section. This will be on page 38. Um, so on Juniper Road, the street currently doesn't have drainage infrastructure, so the proposed project will install drainage and replace the pavement in two phases. The first will address the half of the road starting from Simsbury Road. There's some curb washouts here during heavy rains. There's also been icing issues in the past. And then the second phase will continue up from kind of that first half to the intersection with Rundle Lane. Okay, moving on to page 29 and 30. Um, this is kind of a couple that I categorize my on, our ongoing projects um, funded year over year. Um, the bridge and culvert repair one is actually one like that as well, but, but that was more associated with storm drainage. So the first one is the, our, what's, what I, what's termed MS4, which is the Municipal Separate Storm Sewer System uh, Program. Uh, MS4 is a, a program that, that with state and federal requirements associated with it that we are you know currently um, evaluating and doing doing uh, engineering work associated with that but some of that uh, engineering work is going to identify uh, physical improvements or you know construction work that needs to be done so for the most part while we are spending some of the money on on some of the our engineering stuff the the main thing here is is to is we're trying to just over time to get prepared for those uh, construction works to try and build up because we, it's hard to say up front what um, is going to be needed, but there is a time frame that we're supposed to address those things in when we find them that is shorter than what our budget process is. So it's kind of to try to build up a, a, a reserve to address those when we do find them. Um, the traffic calming program is on page 30. Uh, I think we're all pretty pretty aware of that. We you know we've been pretty active in that. We've held a number of meetings. We're starting to work on, uh, on some of our uh, concept designs that we're going to go back to the public with on these. Uh, we did purchase some temporary uh, um, speed humps with, our, uh, with, some of the mon with some of the monies last year. Uh, and you know we're also using it for some other things but yeah so this is again same sort of thing where we're just trying to anticipate some of the improvements that are going to be needed in the project and while we address some needs as we come up part of this is also to again start to build up a fund a reserve fund that we have so that when projects come up we can you know we can implement them more quickly some smaller projects that aren't you know so large that we need to come back as individual projects on the traffic calming uh, that's pretty much it all. I do want to touch on one other item uh, with your indulgence, uh, which is on page 42, the uh, land use digital conversion. Uh, this was a project that had some funding a few years back, uh, but, but never got continued. Um, again, this gets into what, what you see in the picture there. That's, that is an uh, aerial photo from 1928. You can't really tell where it's at, but you can see the edge of that map and how it's starting to deteriorate. Well, we've got thousands of maps in, in um, our possession that are in flat files that are getting old or else they're rolled up and they, they're, they're just, their condition, every time you have to use them, it deteriorates. And 
what we'd like to do is get them scanned in, make them digital. It, it improves our service to the public. It, it preserves these valuable resources. Um, and, and again, it's, we just get to them so, so much more quickly. They don't deteriorate anymore. We can get them in, in proper storage. Um, and also this project looks into all of our, uh, what we've got for our hard copy building department records and all of our other complaint records and other records we've got in public, in, in planning and public works to get them digitized again for the, much of the same reason, but especially to increase, improve our service to the public and how quickly we can get to the data as, as, as far as how much time we often have to spend trying to find things. Um, and the reason I bring it up this year is that while some of these other projects that you're looking at um, are projects that, that are available for grant monies and stuff like that, it's unlikely that this project will ever be fit a grant funding. So when you, uh, it's, I would ask you to consider when you look at like the ARPA funding and what you're gonna do with it that this may be a time to get this done and protect these records and, and as opposed to putting this one off because the money may be in place now and it'll be much more difficult in the future. All set? I think so. The only other thing I think that was left um, on here, well, one was the, uh, I don't know if, if, if uh, Carrie was going to address that, there was the, uh, uh, the, uh, the um, revaluation dollars, and then there was the, um, the uh, POCD. So, um, are you going to do the evaluation, or is it just going to stand on its own? Yeah. Um, the evaluation is on page 58. It is um, funding. We've been funding this on a spread over a five-year basis. We have to, by Connecticut state law, um, reevaluate assessments. Um, every five years. Um, this just spreads the burden out over a five-year period as opposed to having to fund it all in one year. So this continues that um, thinking. We funded $34,440 in fiscal year 2022 and we are asking for $35,000 in fiscal year 2023 to gear up for the uh, 2024 property reevaluation. Um. Did you want to come up and quickly talk about the few of these? Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, real brief, I, this, this is something that we funded uh, in the capital improvement program last year. You know the page the, number, I'll say. Pardon? You know the page oh, number. I'm sorry. I don't know if it's in the I don't, I don't think it's in the book. I think it's just in the summary of uh, the infrastructure. No, this is POCD. Well, I, I, no, I didn't find it in the book. It's, uh, it's just in the main infrastructure for... Uh, it may be a continuation. So if you look at page 23, yeah. it's, it's, it's in the, the, the table. Right there. 25, is that 23 or 25? 25, I believe. That's not that. Sorry, 25. Is, 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 the, is the proper page. So uh, last year you approved 45,000 uh, to start the plan of conservation development out of the estimated 60,000 that we had come up with to, for, for a two-year program to have it completed. As you know, um, by, by originally thought by October of, uh, or August of, uh, actually August of this, uh, of this year. Uh, uh, since, since then, uh, I believe uh, after talking with the town manager and knowing that, that we were going to be transitioning out, we felt we were, you know, we, we let the new director come on board and sort of put her stamp on it and look over the RFP. So I know Stanley, uh, the town manager, also had some, some uh, thoughts about how we should be doing this uh, project. So we've, we've delayed it. We've talked to OPM, and, and they don't have an issue with us being a little bit uh, Late with with our with our plan, but the the, the extra fifteen thousand we're looking for this year would complete the sixty thousand that we originally estimated. I'll definitely be recommending that. This is um, mandated, so it's 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 it's, it's critical. Uh, but this is also a mandate, and we're kind of behind schedule already. In addition, that we'll get to in the budget modification, 
uh, I'm, I'm looking for a pot of money of probably close to $100,000 so that we can do a uh, plan of conservation and development in concert with our strategic visioning process. I think it will be efficient. It's time for both. Plan of conservation and development is more focused on uh, geographical area, covers other things too, such as economic development. But we need to do it comprehensively, I believe, and take advantage of uh, a one-time process. It's community outreach intensive, both processes. So I think if we combine them and get going with that this year, hopefully um, we're going to we're going to have our strategic vision in place so that we can do some great things and that we'll be working towards as a community. Yeah, I think the 60,000 is it's much less than we did last time we did it. And I think for, for a number of reasons, one is we did get $15,000 from the state. So we will be doing a affordable housing plan along with it, which will be part of the plan of conservation development. So that's 15,000 extra there. Uh, we just completed a complete street study, which will uh, inform our, our transportation plan to a great extent. Um, and also our tax increment financing district study and, and, and policy, which will be a, a good portion of our economic development strategy plan. So that's why I think the 60,000 people said, is that enough? And I said, yes, I think we've, we've invested enough in, in, in our town uh, uh, policies and complete streets, TIFs, and, and so on and so forth, so that we can complete it at, and then perhaps add a little bit more and, and get really get a nice project done, I think, somewhere, and I know the town manager is, is, is always points to Mansfield as a good, great example of what they did uh, uh, on their, uh, to, when they did, uh, did their plan of conservation development, so. All right, so Mayor, um, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Jonathan, should come back to the table for any uh, questions and comments on the infrastructure, and I think following that, this would be a good place to to break if you agree to to break or to end to, the night right i mean break until the next session oh i see uh yeah you guys good with that mm -hmm. <laughs> all right <laughs> <laughs> after we hear from you on infrastructure <laughs> Thank you all for the presentations. Uh, thanks again. Uh, just a couple quick questions here. Uh, you know, we talk about road roadways and repavement, and um, and that's just a hot topic and desired throughout our entire town. And I know um, Dan, you had mentioned as far as the capacity issues with the 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 fund or the the number that's in the budget. Have we ever thought about contracting out? So if the, the council wanted to allocate additional resources, would we be able to contract the work out? So we wouldn't be putting all that capacity on our internal department. So it is something that we have discussed. I think it, it, it's going to be necessary to uh, have further discussions to get a level of comfort on what we can go outside with and what, what we're gonna have to deal with as far as union issues. Okay, and what, what so does that- So we, we do use a series of vendors for paving. We don't pave streets. Public Works hires vendors to pave streets. Mm -hmm. Public Works supports the process. So we do storm drainage repairs, we do curb removals, we do backfilling, mm -hmm. restoration, driveway repairs, um, but we do currently use vendors for resurfacing now. Okay, so it's just a matter of evaluating other options or additional vendors in time Correct. And, and administering the work too. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, 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 there's probably an offline discussion to kind of get some more data around that, but I think that, you know, I hear the appetite of the council. They we may want to put some more money in roads, and we may want to understand what that looks like. Yep. So thank you. Um, I was really disappointed to see that Elizabeth Avenue is not one of the critical items on this list. Uh, at the end, at the middle of one of the intersections going on down Elizabeth. It's, it's like a skating rink in the winter, and ice builds up and it floods, and trees are always down, that big tree that came with the flooding. And I, where is that in the process? Has that even been addressed? I, I just was thinking that it would be on one of the critical lists here. Yeah, so it, it, is, it is an issue that we've identified. Um, we haven't um, advanced it to a level of critical yet. I mean, it is something that 
we would like to repair. The issue there is the road is actually slightly lower than the catch basin. And when I mean slightly, just enough to collect enough water where it, it is an icing issue. And that's one of our hot spots. So every winter, we have a number of locations around the world, town where every morning, when we know when we have freeze, I mean, thaw and freeze, we have to go and address it. And that section on Elizabeth Avenue is part of it. Um, but we can, we can, we can look at, we've, we've talked about trying to do a repair there. Um, it's just not something that has risen to a, to a, a, a priority for us yet. Mm -hmm. uh, I would definitely like to see that offline to see what that would take to kind of get that in the pipeline. I think I've heard enough complaints from a lot of the, the concerns from our residents. So thank you for that. And just to comment on the traffic calming program, you know, this wasn't a very popular program, but it has turned into something very needed and um, I'm excited for it. And we are getting a lot of calls on, give me a speed bump. So I'm really excited to see that we're gonna start building some sustainability with the traffic calming program. Um, and my last comment in regards to the, uh, the infrastructure or use of infrastructure with the land use uh, data digital conversion, I think that that's a smart decision. I also um, echo the town manager's comments on infrastructure bill. I think that, you know, I personally have been putting in the federal infrastructure updates and subcommittee and we're looking to really leverage that. And so I'm excited that we're thinking about that and we're talking about that because that's really important. Um, if I would uh, like the council to also consider the, sorry, I see the hands, I'm coming. <laughs> um, also to consider maybe combining our town clerk has a lot of paper uh, items too, and I understand that our electronic, we're, uh, some seems like we're a little behind with our electronic records, uh, and I think that I know the town clerk has different compliance issues and regulatory issues, but if we were to combine some of these efforts, I really would like to see that because I think that we're a little um, behind when it comes to technology in some of our internal offices. Um, I'm gonna go to the deputy mayor, then Councillor McClary, then I'm just gonna go down the line. Thank you. Um, infrastructure. I'm jumping around because you guys covered a lot. Yes. I keep all my here. Uh, but I think we, we've heard collectively from the group, at least for the infrastructure, the number one or two on my list of priorities. And I'm anxious to hear from the public uh, to hear what they have to say. Uh, and I know that more funding is on its way, but I still think that we have to say that we, we need to get done uh, now. And Dan, my first question is for you on page 49, uh, with respect to the roadway improvements. Uh, you are requesting 1.55 million. Sorry. You're requesting 1.55 for this year, and I'm piggybacking off of the mayor's question about, is that a, um, a capacity issue? Because in this current year, you had $2.2 .2 million. Was that a special allocation? by the council for this current year and were you able to manage that two point so we two? We, we have a fund balance currently <clears throat> um and the, these numbers that you see from fiscal year to fiscal year is what our asset management is telling us we need to spend to keep our roads improving not declining so this is the minimum amount of money that we need to spend to keep our roads average condition our road surface rating improving and that's where how we develop this number okay. so we do have an aggressive program plan this year um, it's out to our uh, utilities right now just to determine we don't we, we distribute it to our utility utilities first because if they have any projects planned that, that impacts our road surface okay. program but you do have the capacity to do more than 1.5 if you got the funding yes we have we have capacity I believe we do Okay. And this year is going to probably be the first year that we're going to we're going to like I said we have a pretty aggressive goal this year. Okay, great. And this next question is for Jonathan, please. Um, oh boy, what page is this? Uh, Which project? Uh, Tunctus Avenue sidewalk. Oh, that's still 47. Yep. Right, and you have that out projected into 2017, and you know this better than I do. But my, uh, 27, excuse me. Uh, would it make sense to look at doing that in conjunction with the library and the Philly Pond projects to have the sidewalks done along, I know the state or the 
the federal government is doing the east side of, no, the west side. Right, right. We've got a project through the state for the west side, and this is for the east side. This is phase two. Um, it could. Um, sure. You know, I, I, um, no, I, I mean, I just, it, it, it sort of, it makes sense. I guess it would all be done at that point. I, I think that, uh, um, you know, that, uh, I guess the only thing I would say is, is the library and Philly Park are both on the west side, which is what we're addressing. Um, there is, when you, all, so from that standpoint, uh, you know, that, that kind of addresses that. But on the other hand, on the east side, as you move up is where more businesses are. Correct. And especially now, you know, we've got, we've put in some more businesses that are, um, what's the word I would say? Uh, that might entice walkers more so even, you know, I mean, there's always Geisers was up there, but now we've got the convenience store there. You know, the, the restaurants have, have, have grown. Um, so from that standpoint, it does make sense, you know, to, also to look at that east side. So I, I'm not opposed to moving that up. I, you know, I, I think it was out there where it was right now, just because I, when I looked at some of the priorities of some of these other things we're looking at and what they mean infrastructure-wise, like getting sidewalk on one side, then you know that this one kind of made sense to push back. But right. it certainly could. Right. And then th this comment is uh, with respect to page 42, the land use digital conversion. Mm -hmm. Uh, assuming arguendo that that takes place and we're able to get funding for it, uh, I know that the Harper Public Library just invested three quarters of a million dollars into a digital library and they are working on digitizing for towns and municipalities throughout the state and they give great rates for municipalities so that may be a place where we go yes. to, to partner collaborate with uh, because they have a tremendous uh, organization that is doing a digital uh, program. Uh, and then the last question I have or point is uh, with flood mitigation, I think you and I spoke offline about communications with uh, a home on Wesleyan Drive, I think Wesleyan Drive and Brentwood. And both of those homes, or at least the one on Brentwood, I saw flooding on the street and in the house. I mean, it mm -hmm. was water this high in the house going upstairs into the basement and the family has no flood insurance. So I'm hoping that we can get those two properties on the list uh, because they really need some help. Yeah. So again, the one on Brentwood, we do have a project in place. Um, the basically, we've got a preliminary design done for it. Um, we're getting, uh, we are working with the property and one of the property owners we need an easement for. So we talked with them just this last week to move forward with that easement. And uh, we are getting, I expect a proposal tomorrow for someone to, to turn that design around quite quickly so we can get that done from a consultant. So we're moving forward definitely on that one. The Wesleyan Terrace one, as far as I'm not familiar with what the issue is there, um, to be honest, I, I don't know that there's a, I mean, we haven't had really had street flooding issues, have we? On well, we had put a curtain drain in there two yep. years ago, right. which has remediated a lot of the, the conditions over there. We're this year looking to evaluate to redo the road over there, which is a total reclamation, um, and including adding additional uh, curtain drains behind the curb line to take the surface water. A lot of surface water comes from Prospect Street down right. to the back of Correct. Trinity and it comes in and floods the yards there. Um, there's some new homeowners up there who have inadvertently put in their own systems. It's created an issue for us as well in the streets, especially during the winter months. So we're looking to try to get that curtain drain and let the, uh, let, have the opportunity for the residents to tie into our curtain drain, which should eliminate a lot of the problem. But I, I do think that, as, as, as Bart said, you know, Prospect Street sits up here, Wesleyan Terrace sits down here. Um, and so, you know, there, there is problems. Uh, we do know that um, in the area of what we're talking about, I believe the house homeowner we're talking, there's a house that sits on the corner of, of the, the uh, southwest corner of Wesleyan Terrace and Trinity Circle. Then that property owner, there, there's, there is, they've had, you know, water issues from coming down from the hill, and last, I believe he has installed. I know he got a permit for from us, but I believe the work is done to install. He put a drainage system in to help uh, deal with the water that he was seeing on his property. He he bounds the property owner, I believe you're talking about, so that probably will help them. 
Okay. And it may also offer them an opportunity for, you know, to tie in if the neighbor would let them if they need to do additional work. But any flooding they're experiencing in the house there or whatever is happening is a private issue. It's not anything to do with any of the town facilities. So I don't, you know, there's, there's a limited amount we could do right. for them. All right. No, no, thank you. That's very helpful. And again, I don't know that there was water in the house on Wesleyan, but I know in Brentwood, I actually yes. saw the water. Well, we're, we're well aware of that uh, one. But yes. the, the flooding coming down off of Prospect onto Wesleyan, three members of the council were out there together, and it looked like Niagara Falls, right? The water just gushing down, streaming down. It was unbelievable. But thank you, and that's yep. the end of my questions and comments. Thank you. Um, thank you. Ivory. Um, and Ivory um, both spent a ton of money putting in um, drainage to stop the water from coming in and you see the erosion of the from the heel of the soil um, so I'm happy that this project um, is on the list and I would ask the, um, my colleagues to support this project as um, there are a lot of elderly folks that live on that side of the the street that would like to do the walk-in and can't because of, in the winter the ice and then in the summer because the erosion of the, um, the soil. So uh, I'm happy to see it and um, I'm happy to see that the town is finally addressing infrastructure um, in our neighborhoods because we are only as strong um, as our neighborhoods. So um, thank you and I um, look forward to supporting some of these infrastructure projects. Councilor Mayor. I was happy to see, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, the roundabout picture uh, <laughs> is, is all thought of roundabouts gone now I have not been able to you know I've not gotten in contact yet to find out where the the Connecticut DOT is at in their redesign or what the reconcept is for that so to back up so so you know the the the, the DOT after, after much um, consideration by the town as well as the DOT they, they did initiate the DOT initiated a project for double roundabouts in the town center um, and but when they actually got into final design or I guess I guess preliminary beyond concept to begin their 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 final design process uh, they redid their traffic numbers and it turns out that they felt that they were too high and that the the, the backups during certain parts of the day would interfere between the two roundabouts for how the distance between them and so they scrapped that project and it got sent back to their concept design unit and when I talked to them when they did this which is going on about a year ago now um, they indicated they hadn't necessarily given up on a roundabout they still wanted to do a project they were still working on a project for that intersection it just was might very likely have a different look to it so the, the director over there, the head of the design unit, basically said about this time this year, I should probably check back early this year with them and see where they're at with it. So I will be doing that to find out where they're at and what, um, you know, what direction they're going in there. But there's, it's not dead. You know, they're definitely still, we're looking at doing something there, but it probably is not going to be the double roundabout project. Thank you. I, I also wonder about uh, the, uh, I'm thinking of the center of town for the roundabouts, but putting those uh, sidewalks in, I'm I'm wondering if we we have sidewalks, for really bike paths going similar places. And I'm wondering if we really should think about turning those sidewalks into bike paths and make it part of the East Coast Greenway. We might be able to get more funding for it too that way. Um, well, that I mean, we had looked at, and that was. There's a possibility that, um, how should I put this? The, 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 well, the best way to say it right now at this point is that there, there is a project underway with the Capital Region Council of Governments. They recently uh, brought on a consultant who's going to do a, hopefully a final route study for the East Coast Greenway 
uh, from Simsbury, so basically through the towns of Bloomfield, Hartford, and East Hartford. Because one of the things we've dealt with all the time with in Bloomfield is we don't know where we're going to connect into Hartford, and that makes it difficult for our planning. And but also this just takes a regional approach to how we do this, and it also believe the, the thought process is, is that you know the state wants to get this done. It's a, it is a priority for the DOT, and that once the steady is in place and a final route is in place that perhaps the state will step up and fund closing the whole gap. So, so that's going to identify what that route is. I do believe that it's possible that the route would um, somehow come down uh, a portion of that, Tunxis Avenue, and then head down um, uh, Wittenberry Avenue. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's one of the locations that seems to make a lot of sense, especially if we can't get in the railroad corridor. The other possibility from that area would be that to possibly use some of the land of the uh, church there. Yeah. Um, so it that's would be a possibility. Very desirable to get both a bike path and a sidewalk for the same mm -hmm. buck. Um, the other thing is we're going to do so much culvert work. Uh, isn't there some, and you're, I expect you'll be going outside for much of that, um, isn't there some advantage to do, make, bundle them all and give one contract or a big contract, which will get a better price? I mean, I mean there, is, there is economy of scale. Sure. Um, so, I mean, once they get their equipment in town, they might as well do them all. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's a matter of, of, of really getting um, a good plan on what needs to be done at each location. You know, um, some of these projects are obviously much larger than others. Yeah. Um, and to give one contractor um, five projects that may take them six months of project may not be the most efficient way to get it done. So, um, but yes, there is economy of scale, and there typically always is, you know, as a general mm -hmm. practice. But on the other hand, I mean, the the fact that these culverts are just scattered around town, I mean, it's not, we don't have that big a town, but they're still remobilizing to yeah. each one of these. So really, the only thing you're saving on is some of the costs associated with bonding and some of the general administration on the project you aren't probably setting a whole a whole lot up on mobilization and and a culvert project unlike some other projects um they're in and they're out there isn't it's not a situation where you're going to have three or four different crews that need to come in throughout it they they get they go in they do them it's pretty much the same crew through the whole thing so you're not going to also going to get the advantage of well, when their you know landscaping crew is working here, their their you know excavation crew can be working over here. So I don't think you see the economy. You're going to see the economy of scales on those projects that you might on some other ones by putting them together. But it's a thought. You know, we'd certainly can look at it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Harrington. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I had a question, just in reference to uh, sidewalk repair and installation and. Uh, Road repair. Is there, uh, and I'm just going to fall back to my, my days at the city of Hartford where we had a, a minority business enterprise where we worked with minority and women owned businesses. Um, do we have anything set here where some of this contracted work could be set aside for? You know, businesses in in the town of Bloomfield that meet those that type of criteria. Uh, we have a lot of infrastructure activity going on, and it it would seem, you know, to be the right time to bring some of those businesses on board, at least to evaluate uh, their proficiency in, in, in those particular you know areas. And give them so, an because of the type of funding that we utilize for road work and sidewalk repairs, we have to follow the guidelines of the state. So there is a minority set aside for um, any state funded projects over $50,000. So we, we are following the state requirements for you know, distribution of work to minority small business and women business enterprises. But at the same time, we are also bound to you know, certain rules of procurement that says that, you know, we, we, right now the town does not have a, you know, a local preference policy. So without that, you know, we, we, we have to go, you know, if we're going out to bid, we've got to do it by the bids. If we're getting prices again, 
I guess that maybe could be a little bit different to how, where or how many, where we get quotes from, but that's just for things under 80,000. So once we get over 80,000, we've got to go out to bid. And at that point, it's an open competitive bid. So, and, and generally with state funds, we're not allowed to use local procurement and local preferences anyway for state or federal funds. So as soon as we kick into the state or federal funds, typically we can't give the preference. The preference can only be used for our local, you know, our, our town funds. So if we did secure some of the uh, federal dollars for infrastructure type activities, it wouldn't apply because it's federal. I doubt it. Yeah, I doubt it because they're, they're, I mean, I, I, haven't, I haven't actually read all the rules mm -hmm. to like ARPA. Certainly the infrastructure bill as well not allow us to use local preference. I don't know about the ARPA funds, but uh, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it gets more, you know, it, it's more difficult to use those preferences when, when we are using grant dollars of any kind. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Curtin, thoughts? No, that's okay. Um, so I just want to, I just want to sidetrack and follow up. You said that grants, you're talking about federal grants. When you look, <clears throat> If someone is looking from at home, looking at this and say, okay, I'm looking at a five-year plan, $17 million budget, what percentage of that you're going to get grants? Because uh, it kind of could be a little misleading when you right. look at it. It says, is that coming directly from taxpayer dollars or, I mean, we all know overall it's taxpayer dollars, but I'm just saying for the sake of conversation and looking at the numbers and trying to equate that to what's realistic, what is going to come out of our funds and what we're expecting from the state and federal government. Do you know where that is in here, Gary? Uh, oh, here it is. It's on the on sheet the, right there. Yep, yeah. on the, the, your yeah. supplemental sheet, right, Yeah, no, I, I, I was just saying for the public. It's, it's difficult yeah. for folks to follow. So I was just trying to get Jonathan to kind of. Well, I mean, talk. looking at, at, yeah, right. So I mean, in general, looking at the current year, year's budget, um, you know, I think what's proposed total, why, now this, you see, you can't go by this because, so what did we spend last year out of our, on CIP, out of our general fund, do you know, is about a little over like a million? Eight. I thought it was eight hundred eighty thousand. Eight hundred. So under a million dollars of, of last year's funding was, you know, was came out of yeah. general fund, if you will. So and then, then, then we we did, you know, there's LOSIP comes from the state, and then we get the capital grant every year, which last year was about one point eight or something million. All right, so, so let's so let's do it this way. Um, let's look at the proposed budget for this year, and we're at least in the proposed budget, um, we are recommending around $5.5 .5 million for CIP mm -hmm. projects. Um, if you look at this spreadsheet, um, for state grants, we're looking at uh, just over $2.5 million, so roughly 50%. This does not factor in any of the federal projects that we've, that we've talked about. Um, so yes, grant funding is significant, has been the majority, uh, I think you could safely say, historically, we're asking the council, but this also includes some ARPA dollars, uh, and some fund balance, to step it up to 2.5 million compared to uh, just under a million dollars in the current year. Thanks. I would say, I think in a typical year in the back, in, in Historically, we're looking at about a third, probably, of the dollars okay. actually come from the, That's good. the town and the rest Thanks. of the grant. Yeah. Thanks for that. And this, this, is a, this is a question for the town manager. I know, I think it was well received when you said that with the federal, with the Biden administration talking about, you know, build back better. Um, in looking at this document here, how do you decipher what which projects you can shift without affecting the quality of life? As we, what, what matrix did we go through to figure out what we could push uh, future years just to say, let's see what they're going to do, what Bloomfield is going to be able to get from whatever funds comes through the state? 
Yeah, I, I think it was really just uh, looking at those projects that uh, at this point it's the staff assessment of those that are most critical, those that have been on the books for a long time uh, and just uh, prioritizing those is, is critical for this year. No, I, I think this is, uh, this is one area that I believe when we talk about quality of life and how it impacts our community, it's definitely an area that we need to do better that we haven't done over the year, obviously with climate change and all the various factors. I mean, last year, I think it was last year, I think it was painful in trying to visit some of the, the homes and properties and seeing an entire house just flooded, right? And a lot of that has to do with our infrastructure. Uh, that's part of the, the issue. There's no way around it. A lot of the structure is dated and cannot maintain the level of flow of water flow when we have these constant you know, rain over <laughs> days over days. So I think it's critical for us to really invest the funds to try to mitigate those issues because it directly impacts our community. And um, I, I don't think there's, I believe that it's important to really, as we go through this process, uh, town manager with the ARPA funds, this is one area that I believe with this one time funding that we could really have make an impact in how we take care of the, the community because infrastructure is a key part of any vital uh, town that you want to attract folks to move here, business to want to do business here. We, we have to do better when it, come for, when it comes to infrastructure. And it's not germane to Bloomfield. Obviously, there's a major discussion across the, the country because we've neglected, uh, you know, when you travel around the globe, our country is way behind when it comes to our infrastructure. So I think locally we, we could have an impact here in how we deal with some of the issues that every single state is struggling with. So thank you. And, and just to quickly tie team on that, um, we had a session at the Finance Subcommittee meeting talking about the consultant and how to kind of fall in through. Um, we are proceeding with the other um, uh, vendor um, had a good long discussion. In fact, I had two discussions with them today. I'm just very excited for the council, starting with the finance subcommittee, to uh, get to know this group. Interestingly enough, and I guess I must have just just felt something, um, but they've been following even these budget discussions, so they're up to date. They know what 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 you've seen. But beyond ARPA is what I'm really worried about, these competitive grants for the infrastructure bill, the very thing that we've discussed this evening. That's the kind of partner that we're going to need uh, who's already paying attention, who's already familiar with all of the, 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 the federal requirements, particularly with some of these past programs, um, and who will help us keep the eye and get started um, applying uh, and, and hopefully also helping us in the project management uh, sphere as well. And, and just, one, just a follow comment to that, I think the one area that we have to really, uh, and I know I've talked about it, Jonathan, when we have these projects, it's great that we have it outlined here in the budget and we're talking about support, but I think what's important for the community, they want to see that I can go online and see, okay, this street is being taken care of, there's a timeline, phase one, phase two, what's the reason for not finishing it off, what's the reason for, this, uh, for stalling the project. I think having those updates lessen the frustration mm -hmm. that comes from the community. And it, it, I, I think we have to do something there to be able to you know, have something where folks can go and they can feel that there's something happening. You know, that's, that's a key area that we have to improve. Council Thanks. Ron. Communication is very important. Um, so uh, one thing that I want to touch on is I'm very encouraged to see that Hill Farm Road uh, made it on the list. And not only that it made it on the list, but it was the first thing there. I don't know if that was done by design, but um, it must have been. But um, you know, this is a uh, flooding that I've experienced myself uh, because Hill Farm Road, I live right on hilltops. This is right down the street from me. Um, 
and just the flooding overall that happens in our town, the immense property damage that's caused uh, by this flooding, um, and the fact that some of our residents have been waiting for up to 15 years uh, for this, for some relief, um, this is something that is uh, far overdue. Um, but you know, the town manager brought up a great point that there's gonna be additional funds coming from the federal <coughs> government uh, that can provide that relief. So striking that balance, um, it's gonna, it's gonna prove, uh, I guess, a bit difficult. Um, but nonetheless, uh, it's far overdue for our residents to get some relief. Um, and then just then, I wanna also thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, it was very insightful and I was happy to see a lot of these projects on the list. Councilor Pilatus? Yeah, just a, a, just a question or comment. Um, and, and then uh, another comment on the traffic comment program. But um, I live on Prospect. <clears throat> and I just had a question. There's a, there's a house on Trinity Circle that was recently sold. And they're doing curtain drains. And those curtain drains come right out to the That's. Yeah, so that's um, an issue that we, they are, I guess you would say under an order to correct that in some fashion. Okay. It's kind of a matter of what or how we're gonna do that. Um, you know, if, if the cur if the under drain is put in then they can tie into that, that makes life a lot easier for them. Right, right now, otherwise we were looking at probably trying to put some sort of underground storage in, which is still gonna, you know, would let the water leak out, but it, it wouldn't be as fast. But yeah, we are aware of that, and we are trying. You know, we're we're trying to work with the property owner to address it and get something that we can all live with. Okay, so that, that was just a curiosity yeah. there because I saw it, I was like, "Wow, it doesn't seem like." But. Right, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> um, secondly, on the traffic coming, obviously, uh, Prospect Street is getting their hearing next week, and uh, there's quite a bit of buzz on Prospect Street. Um, and I guess one of the things I was Historically, we had one one resident on our street at one point. Maybe probably was back almost ten years ago now. That went from house to house to house, got a petition signed, and the town put in a little uh, right about Garrison, right just past Garrison Terrace, a little zigzag in there with, with cones. Um, I'm not exactly sure how effective it was overall. It was somewhat effective slowing people down, um, but they just accelerated right out of it. However, we did come down for the winter for plowing um, and never went back up. So my, I guess my question is with all the traffic comments we're talking about, um, is engineering working with public works, trying to come up with plans that are going to be permanent solutions to the problem and not let's put it down for the, we'll put it down for the summer and not for the winter. And, because if you're talking about temporary speed bumps and stuff like that, you know, obviously you want you, you don't want a ton of speed bumps to plow right now. But I know on Prospect Street, I watched. I was walking my dog this morning. I watched as a customer of mine who was elderly was driving up Prospect Street, and the car behind them passing yes. them up the hill, where it's completely blind, <coughs> doing probably 50, 60 miles an hour. So I mean, obviously there's a need there. Well, there's two things associated with that. The, the idea of the um, temporary speed humps is, and, and, and oftentimes what can be done is like what they did there, and, and we're gonna look at those. Part of what we'll do um, with the program is there are certain measures that you can do, like temporary measures to see how they work. One, you can see how effective they are, and two, it gives the, um, it gives the residents you know, in the area the experience and then they can, before we spend a bunch of money, 
we can, you know, we can, they can, we can, they can figure out if they really want it or not once they realize how it's going to affect them. So that's that's the idea of buying these temporary speed humps and some of these other things. But no, the intent is we're going to come up with solutions that would be permanent. And again, it, back to to your first comment about they just speed up again, and that's part of what. Um, makes it costly because you can't just do one or two in a, in a stretch. You've got to do them every six, five, six hundred feet or something like that, or six to eight hundred feet to be effective. So if you, you know, Prospect Street isn't that long, but you're still probably looking at at least two or three, but you start looking at Maple or, or and if you're going to do something like that, you're suddenly doing a whole lot of measures to make it effective, and, and so the cost goes up pretty rapidly. Um, and yeah, I mean, Prospect Street is one I expect um, that it's a street that, you know, with the with the advent of everybody's, you know, in vehicle navigation, that's a street where I think they get kicked to a lot because it's slightly shorter than than going a blue, you know, blue or Bloomfield Avenue to get through. So you know that it it really is a good candidate for trying to yeah to, to I, discourage that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Councilor DeBethan Brown, our last comment of the night. Thank you. So, um, is that a time limit? <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just going to oh, give the other councilors a caveat. <laughs> 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 Starters, like with respect to the Park Avenue flooding and Tungsis Avenue, those are state roads, so they're not ours to address. They're, they're the state roads. Um, obviously, as I explained earlier, with respect to these, we prioritized uh, flooding that was affecting houses or significant property damage. But right now, really, the, the seven that are there are all all affect houses. So, so that was prioritized. So those are the ones I'm aware of. I don't know of other than ones we, you know, that that are a result of our system being undersized in our effect housing. So that was that was a priority right now, and then we're going to work forward from there to try and address. But we're never going to completely address street flooding. So right. So um, I, I know that um, uh, Park Avenue is in our road, and um, the one going up to. I know that's yeah. that's not our road. Question is, how do we get that information to our residents? Mm. Because what you're going to see is someone's being taken care of, and I'm not. So that was the question. Okay. How do we help our mm. residents who will not necessarily get the information and or understand? How do we help them to understand so that we don't get the barrage of calls? that my taxpayer's money is fixing his road, but it's not fixing my road, but they need to understand that there's some other uh, factors that's 
going into what we're doing. I think that gets back to um, Councilor Curtin and the Hatmont. Communication. Communication will be on our website, yes, so we probably I, need to to put a flooding page up there too and identify how we're, we're prioritizing things. I think I'm you're right, to, yes. Someone is going to call each of you and ask what's going on. I would also like to put a plug out there. I don't know if it's possible, but for residents who do not have flood insurance and who have had um, devastating damage, it would be wonderful for us to use some of the ARPA funds and be able to help them in some way. Because we have seen devastation, meaning total loss. We went to one house, and the water was coming out the garage. So we knew that everything in the house, sort of pro would have to come and rip everything out. And they didn't have flood insurance. So I would put a plug in there for our residents who have been impacted the most with all this flooding and do not have um, flood insurance that we try some way, somehow, to help Thank you, and, and speaking of communication, uh, infrastructure was a big topic for the community, and if you have questions for the town manager, his office, or the presenters, you can email budget2023 at bloomfieldconnecticut.org, and your questions will be answered um, by town staff. So just wanted to make sure the public knew that that was available. With that, thank you so much for your presentation. Any co last comments, Mr. Town Manager, before? Yes, on Thursday, we're going to get started with planning and development. We'll also have public safety. Public safety only has one budget modification, so depending on your questions, that should go pretty, pretty efficiently. Um, and then library will be last. Okay. Um, Bloomfield, Connecticut. Excuse me, ct.org. CT. Thank you. Budget 2023 at BloomfieldCT.org. Thank you for that correction. <laughs> um, yes, Mr. Geiner. There's a planning and town plan and zoning commission meeting on Thursday, so Jennifer oh. and I both will be there. Have to be. Oh, okay. So All we right. won't, unfortunately. <laughs> All we're right. So we'll, so we'll, so we'll, we'll, um, we'll have to reschedule, reschedule some other night. Day. What Thursday? Any other okay. night would be. I think. All right. Thank you. All right. Letting me know that. And, and, and with that. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second, uh, moved by count, uh, Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councilor McClary. <laughs> Have a great night, everyone. Thanks for joining.